Good evening and welcome to the October 5th, 2020 virtual legislative meeting of the Anne Arundel County Council. We are now in session. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Ms. Ronvian? Present. Ms. Hare? Present. Ms. Lacey? Present. Mr. Volke? Mr. Volke? No, sorry, I said present. Mr. Prusky? Here. Ms. Fiedler? Present. Ms. Pickard? Present. Madam Legislative Counsel, Ms. Schuett? Present. And Madam Auditor, Ms. Smith? Present. Okay, Madam Chair, all counsel are present. Thank you. Please pause for the invocation led by Ms. Rodvian. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, tonight for our invocation, I'd like to recognize um, a notorious person who passed away in recent weeks, um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, as a council made up of five women, um, in some way, we all stand on her shoulders. She was an advocate for women's rights, LGBTQ rights, people with disabilities. Um, and she also wrote many famous dissenting opinions in that they might be a blueprint for future changes to come. Um, and I'm going to share a few of her words from a speech that she gave in 2019. If I am notorious, it's because I had the good fortune to be alive and a lawyer in the late 1960s. Then, and continuing through the 1970s for the first time in history, it became possible to urge before courts successfully that equal justice under the law required all arms of government to regard women as persons equal in stature to men. In my college years, 1950 to 1954, it was widely thought that women were not suited for many of life's occupations, lawyering, bartending, military service, foreign service, driving trucks, piloting planes, policing, and serving on juries, to take just a few of many examples that now seem senseless. It was exhilarating to help bring down the barriers that, in Justice Brennan's words, put women less on a pedestal than in a cage. So much has changed for the better since then. True, we have not reached nirvana, but the progress I have seen in my lifetime makes me optimistic for the future. Our communities, our nation, our world will be increasingly improved as women achieve their rightful place in all fields of human endeavor. At a reception some years ago, a college student asked if I could help her with an assignment. She had one question and hoped to compose a paper by asking diverse people to respond. What she asked, did I think was the largest problem for the 21st century. My mind raced past privacy concerns in the electronic age, terrorist threats, deadly weapons, fierce partisan divisions in our legislature and polity. I thought of, I thought of Thurgood Marshall's praise of the evolution of our constitution's opening words, we the people. To embrace once excluded, ignored, or undervalued people, people held in human bondage, Native Americans, women, even men who owned near real, no real property. I thought next of our nation's motto, e pluribus unum, of many, one. The challenge is to make or keep our communities places where we can tolerate, even celebrate our differences while pulling together for the common good. Of, my, of many, one is the main aspiration, I believe. It is my hope for our country and for the world. And now I hope you will join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. At this time, we will now hear from County Attorney Greg Swain for the Open Meetings Act statement. Good evening. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Greg Swain, the County Attorney. At the request of the council chair, we have reviewed some of the council rules for meetings, and this revised statement is a result of that review. A written opinion on these rule issues was also provided to the chair and through her to the council. The Maryland Open Meetings Act, a state law, requires public meetings 
to be open to the public and to be held in places reasonably accessible to individuals who would like to attend these meetings. In addition, provisions of the county charter and the rules of the county council require meetings to be open to the public and to be held at the county seat, meaning Annapolis. The virtual format of this meeting of the county council is due to the COVID-19 emergency and is necessary in light of the serious health risk associated with public gatherings, as well as the governor's various executive orders limiting public gatherings. While a virtual meeting of this type was not envisioned by the Maryland Open Meetings Act, steps have been taken to ensure that this virtual meeting includes alternate accessibility features that the Open Meetings Act Compliance Board and the courts have reviewed and approved, such as having a call-in phone number that allows anyone with a telephone to call in and listen to the meeting, broadcasting the meeting with video and audio on cable TV and on the internet, allowing written public comments to the legislation to be filed with the clerk and considered by the council, and now allowing the public to call in or appear via Zoom and testify live. The County Office of Law has opined that the public access provided by this technology makes this virtual meeting reasonably accessible to the public as required by the Open Meetings Act. At the request of council, we have also reviewed whether with these technological features in place, it is still necessary to suspend council rules 3-105 and 3-106 that require public participation and reasonable seating for the public and the media. Our conclusion is that it is not necessary to suspend these rules. For the same reason, we have concluded that the measures implemented by the council for virtual meetings satisfy the reasonable accessibility requirement under the Open Meetings Act. The virtual format of the meetings allows public participation and media access as required by the rules and also allows unlimited participation that is not subject to the seat capacity limits in the chambers. For these reasons, we have concluded that the requirements of rule 3-105 and 3-106 are being satisfied and therefore it is not necessary to waive these rules or suspend these rules. Council has also asked whether it is necessary to suspend rule 3-102 and 3-103 which require the meeting to be held at the county seat. In 2013, at the request of the council, we opined that a council member who was appearing at a meeting via a live video monitor would satisfy the venue requirement through virtual presence. We also note that the administrative officer to the council controls the hearing and is present in the Arundel Center in Annapolis during meetings, and that the virtual meeting is hosted by the assistant administrative officer from a location in Annapolis. Those factors support our conclusion that the meetings are being held at the county seat, and therefore it is not necessary to, to suspend rules 3-102 and 3-103. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Swain. Madam Secretary, please read the ethics statement. The Ethics Commission has asked that I advise you that under certain circumstances, members of the public may qualify as lobbyists when they testify before the county council. If so, the law requires that certain information be filed with the Ethics Commission. The chairman of the Ethics Commission has asked that those who wish to testify in any form review the general information on lobbying sheet located on the ethics website under forms and publications. If there are any questions about lobbying requirements, please contact the Ethics Commission at 410-222-4413. Thank you, Madam Secretary. As we move into the invitation to audience portion of this meeting, I want to remind our members of the public who are joining us to test their audio and microphone and follow all prompts for talking and unmuting. We will now open our invitation to audience. Madam Secretary, do we have any comments or communications on any subject not included in the printed agenda received from members of the public? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, we received four submissions of online written testimony, which was shared with the Council and posted on the County website. Thank you. We will now hear from members of the public who signed up ahead of time. We have two people signed up to speak on matters not listed on the agenda. When it is your turn, please unmute yourself and begin by stating your name and address for the record. Remarks will be limited to two minutes. We will begin with Mr. Brooks Chandelmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chandelmeyer. Are you with us? Yes, Madam Chair. You have two minutes, sir. 
Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the council. Uh, I want to thank you for um, hosting this meeting and let me speak before you tonight. Uh, as the new alderman of Annapolis's fifth ward, I look forward to working with all of you on issues that impact both the city and the county. I wanted to talk today to thank County Executive Stuart Pittman for his responsible handling of the coronavirus pandemic. We are seeing what happens in states that have weakened their restrictions foolishly and it has led to increases nationwide. And uh, a good example to see why that is not best practice is to look at the top story on CNN with the Trump uh, administration's super spreader event at the White House. So I would encourage the members of the council to follow County Executive Pittman's lead and ensure responsible reopening policy is followed to keep our citizens healthy and safe. Thank you, and I yield with my time. Thank you, Mr. Shandemeyer. Uh, next, we have Mr. Michael Brown. Mr. Brown, are you with us this evening? Uh, yes, can you, can the council hear me? We can. Can you please state your name and address for the record? Yes, Michael Brown, 7651 Timbercross Lane, Glen Burnie, Maryland, 21060. Um, I wanted to bring up to the council this evening about inconsistent and incorrect data that the health department of this county is sharing with the public. Um, this week, uh, late last week, I identified uh, this information and alerted the health department. Um, they stated that their information was correct. Their data does not match what is on the, uh, the State Department of Health's website even, uh, which backs up the data that I've been tracking. So I encourage the council to work with the health department um, and the health officer to get this information corrected. Um, in addition to, I do not know when the last work group update meeting was, but still I would like to push as a resident of the county since this body is making his helping make decisions is that this work group minutes are available or it is live streamed on YouTube or on Arundel TV. Um, that's it, and I yield back my time. Thank you, sir. This time we have no one else signed up to speak. We will close the invitation to audience. Is there any item any council member would like to place on the agenda at this time? Seeing no movement, may I have a motion that the partial reading of any bill resolution, amendment to a bill or resolution or minutes constitutes the reading of the whole? Lacey, so moved. May I have a second? Rodby and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. The motion carries. Madam Secretary, please read the minutes of the September 21st, 2020 meeting. The meeting was called to order by Chairman Allison Pickard at 6 p.m. Ms. Fiedler gave the invocation followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. May I have a motion to approve the minutes of September 21st, 2020? Motion to approve, Councilman Persky. May I have a second? second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Seeing none, the motion carries. The minutes of the September 21st, 2020 meeting stand approved as read. Madam Secretary, please read the titles of any bills to be introduced this evening. Bill number 8420, an ordinance concerning current expense budget, Board of Education, supplementary appropriations. Bill number 8520, an ordinance concerning public works, utilities, water and wastewater system connections and charges. Bill number 8620, an ordinance concerning subdivision and development, subdivision, site development, plan review timelines and requirements. Bill number 8720, an ordinance concerning public safety and zoning, pet care businesses and commercial kennels. <clears throat> Excuse me. Bill number 8820, an ordinance concerning zoning, identification signs on automobile gasoline station canopies.
Thank you. Madam Secretary, please read the titles of any resolutions to be introduced this evening. Resolution number 4020, resolution approving the nomination of a member to the Anne Arundel County Human Relations Commission. Resolution number 4120, resolution recognizing Monday, October 12, 2020 as Indigenous Peoples Day in Anne Arundel County. Thank you, Madam Chair. We will vote on resolution number 4020 later this evening. Ms. Rodbian. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move to suspend the rules to uh, hear and vote on resolution 4120 as well. May I have a second? Lacey, second. Madam Secretary, can you please call the roll on the motion to suspend the rules to vote on resolution 4120 after the public hearings and call of bills for final reading? Ms. Rodvian? Aye. Ms. Hare? Aye. Ms. Lacey? Aye. Mr. Volke? You're muted, sir. Nay. Nay. Mr. Prusky? No. Aye. Ms. Fiedler? Aye. Ms. Pickard? Aye. Six in the affirmative, one in the negative. The motion to suspend the rules to vote on resolution number 4120 uh, after the conclusion of bills for final reading and vote is passed. Thank you. Madam Secretary, please read the title of bill number 57-20 as amended. Yes, Madam Chair, and as a reminder, as we move now to public hearings and discussions, I'd like to remind particularly everyone in administration that every time they speak, they should state their name. Thank you. Uh, bill number 5720, an ordinance concerning licensing and zoning manufactured mobile homes located outside a mobile park. This is Mr. Pruski's bill. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair, Councilman Andrew Prusky. Um, I certainly want to thank the Office of Planning and Zoning and my colleagues for coming to Solution uh, to help resolve an issue that we've been addressing for a while. We've had a work session and I think how many public hearings now <laughs> where this has been discussed. So I, I think we're ready to vote and move on. But thank you again uh, for your support. And I ask my colleagues to support as well. Thank you. Mr. Barron, would the administration like to weigh in on this bill before we move to vote? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Pete Barron with the administration. Uh, we have nothing further to add. We're happy to answer any questions uh, the council may have at this point, but agree with Councilman Pruski. We're ready to vote. Are there any questions from the council on Bill 57-20 as amended at this time? Seeing none, we will now open the public hearing on Bill number 57-20 as amended. Madam Secretary, do we have any testimony received from members of the public? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, we had two submissions of online written testimony, which was shared with the council and posted on the county website. Thank you. We did not have any members of the public sign up to speak. The public hearing on bill number 5720 as amended is now closed. Madam Secretary, please read the title of bill number 5720 as amended. Bill number 5720, an ordinance concerning licensing and zoning manufactured mobile homes located outside a mobile home park. Is there any further discussion? Ms. Lacey? Thank you, Madam Chair, Sarah Lacey, District 1. I may have just um, forgotten this as I was rereading the bill, but uh, perhaps the sponsor could clarify, um, does the bill allow one or more manufactured home units per 60 contiguous acres. Mr. Prusky. Madam Chair, it's one. Um, again, the subdivision process is a whole new process. This is one unit that was actually addressed when we first discussed this bill, nothing has changed with that. If you have the acreage, only one is allowed uh, on that property. If you go through the subdivision process, that obviously would split it and then would not meet the 60 acre threshold and so on. So to answer your question, it is one. Madam Chair, if I may, just to follow up. Ms. Lacey. Thank you. Um, I guess I understood the part about the subdivision process, but I just wanted to make sure that it's clear for the record. Does that also apply when uh, you have the same ownership 
of the 60 contiguous acres. Suppose, you know, I have four kids and I have 60 acres, which I don't, but let's say I did, and I wanted to put each one in their own manufactured home on my 60 acres. Can I do that under this bill or would I have to subdivide under this bill to be able to do that? Councilman Pruski in response in the Office of Law and also um, the administration could follow up. Again, when we discussed this at the initial piece that you have a property and if you decide to put a manufactured home versus a single home, you have to choose, you can't have both. So obviously um, it would be one per that acreage. And again, you can't have four different pieces. The reason why I said subdivision, you could have 120 acres split it into two, two 60 different parcels. And then there's a process for that. But again, it's only one per, per that acreage. You can't have multiple that are there. Thank you. Ms. Shewitt. Yes, I just wanted to confirm that the manufactured home is treated as a single family dwelling and the code already requires that there can only, or mandates that there can't be any more than one dwelling on a lot. So if you had however many acres you said, 10 acres, and you had kids that wanted to live also on that acreage, you would need to subdivide to put a dwelling of any nature, whether it's a manufactured home or not. Is there any further discussion on Bill 57-20? Seeing none, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on Bill Number 57-20 as amended. Ms. Rodvian? Aye. Ms. Hare? Aye. Ms. Lacey? Aye. Mr. Volke? Aye. Mr. Prusky? Aye. Ms. Fiedler? Aye. Ms. Pickard? Aye. Seven in the affirmative, none in the negative. Bill 5720 as amended is passed. Madam Secretary, please read the title of Bill Number 61-20 as amended. Bill Number 6120, an ordinance concerning public works, utilities, backflow preventers, water and wastewater. This is an administration bill. Mr. Barron, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Pete Barron with the administration joining me at the virtual table from DPW, Ms. Henry and Mr. Thompson, from finance, Ms. McQuaid, and from law, Ms. Kenny. Um, as you will recall, this uh, bill, like the previous bill was uh, amended at, a, at the last council meeting and discussed at, at the work session. Um, just a quick recap, the purpose of bill 6120 is to make corrections and changes to the various provisions of article th 13 pertaining to utilities and water and wastewater procedures. Uh, we ask that you pass the bill tonight. I wanna thank uh, members of the council, uh, members of the administration office of law uh, for, for working through the amendments on, that we were, were accepted at the last meeting. And, and we think this bill is in a good space and hope that you will pass it tonight. Happy to answer any questions that council still has. Are there any questions of the administration at this time? Seeing none, we will now open the public hearing on bill number 61-20 as amended. Madam Secretary, do we have any testimony received from members of the public? Uh, no, Madam Chair, we do not have any submissions of uh, written testimony. Thank you. We did not have any members of the public sign up to speak. Therefore, the public hearing on bill number 61-20 as amended is now closed. Madam Secretary, please read the title of bill number 61-20 as amended. Bill number 6120, an ordinance concerning public works, utilities, backflow preventers, water and wastewater. Is there any further discussion at this time? Seeing none. Madam Secretary, please call the roll on bill number 61-20 as amended. Ms. Rodvian? Aye. Ms. Hare? Aye. Ms. Lacey? Aye. Mr. Volke? Aye. Mr. Pruski? Aye. Ms. Fiedler? Aye. Ms. Pickard? Aye. Seven in the affirmative. None in the negative. Bill number 61-20 is passed. 
Madam Secretary, please read the title of Bill Number 62-20 as amended. Bill Number 62-20, an ordinance concerning public safety off-the-road motorcycles. Mr. Pruski, this is your bill. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I want to thank everybody for the council's, uh, council's patience um, in dealing this. And certainly, I think we have a bill um, that makes sense uh, that we're trying to put in to deal with an issue, but also give folks who may not have a concern a way uh, to have it. And again, I did uh, have a chance to talk with some additional police officers about enforcement. And they said this absolutely makes sense uh, when you're going out. And, and by the way, just in terms of the state code, in terms of traffic law, uh, somebody asked me this before, I don't know if it was a colleague or, or it was through the public session. There are already rules on the books that you can't be riding um, non-licensed vehicles in the road. Uh, so again, this just address a noise factor in terms of a dwelling, but understand in the state code already in terms of the motor vehicle law, um, if you do see someone riding an unregistered or unlicensed vehicle, uh, you can call the police and have that. Again, not separate from this bill, but I did want to let folks know because they asked that, you know, what can I do? Because I see somebody riding a motorbike in my community and it's very dangerous and certainly they should be riding in the area it is. So the bill, um, again, that's forward in front of you is 300 feet from a dwelling. Um, and it does allow, obviously, what we passed that amendment uh, before where a neighbor um, who does agree an adult um, obviously would, uh, you know, would agree and that would be in areas that nobody would really care. So again, the police, uh, everyone seems to make sense and I'd ask my colleagues to support this bill. Thank you. Would the administration like to respond or weigh in at this time? Thank you, Madam Chair. Pete Barron with the administration. Joining me is Major Passman from police and from law, Ms. Kenny. Um, it, as uh, Councilman Pruski said, this bill was amended at the previous meeting. Uh, the administration is in support, has nothing further to add, and our and we stand ready to answer any questions or uh, sign the bill if the council so desires. Thank you. Are there any questions from the council at this time? Ms. Ms. Fiedler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Amanda Fiedler, District 5. This question is for the um, sponsor. If these um, vehicles are not are being ridden, but they're not on private property, where can you give an example of where they're where these are taking place, these offenses that aren't offenses yet? Mr. Pruski? Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. You may have recalled Mr. Evans testified at constituent at the last meeting, um, and he stated that he has a neighbor and he has a very narrow lot, which it, even though has to be a rural area, um, and essentially uh, a neighbor is riding probably within 100 or 150 feet of his lot, and you could probably imagine and what you stated, if you're not familiar with a motorbike, um, it can rattle your table. And he mentioned uh, in his testimony, obviously, that he couldn't even sit still and have a conversation with his wife. So again, that's an example uh, in my district. I know there's been other areas. I believe Ms. Pickard has had folks riding uh, in the community and other things. Uh, again, I want to restate there are motor vehicle laws where you're not supposed to be riding an unregistered vehicle. Uh, in certain areas, but this mostly dealt uh, with noise in, in a narrow lot. So that's an, just to give you an example of, of where it can occur. Thank you. Uh, this is Allison Pickard, Chair, District 2. So in my district, um, folks are riding these kind of vehicles in BG&E right-of-ways and state property that run behind a residential area. So that was that's an issue going on in, in, in District 2. Mr. Volke, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Nathan Volke, District 3. Um, I noticed that Major Passman is here. I just wanted to check from a police department standpoint, Major, how many um, calls are you getting, you could say monthly or annually, uh, for this type of an issue where you're hearing a, a noise problem that's produced from an off-the-road motorcycle uh, that's being operated on private property uh, or public property or, or some other property? Would be, but I guess somewhere else. Um, that you're getting a call for service and you all are limited to not being able to help the homeowner because of this lack of a noise ordinance. Hi, Major Ross Passman with the Anne Arundel County Police. Um, I don't have an exact number. It happens um, periodically. Most of our complaints are those complaints of people riding in the roadway where we're dealing with unregistered vehicles or driving without a license. 
but there are people that do call us about the noise from these motorbikes. And, and as the uh, person said last meeting, it does rattle them and, and it does cause a lot of problems uh, for their home life. So um, it's every once in a while, but it's a, it, it will be a good tool to uh, prevent that from occurring in the future. Again, we are gonna be handling it as an education matter in the beginning. And you know, luckily we have that tool if we need it. Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair, appreciate that. Uh, Nathan Volke, District 3 again. I um, did have one follow-up question, Major. In terms of the noise ordinances that already exist in the county code, um, I know of one particularly that do, deals more with dwellings, not necessarily off-road motorcycles, but that indicates um, if noise can be heard more than 50 feet away, that that can be a violation. Are you able to use that provision of the code to enforce this same idea? And if not, uh, why not? In the noise ordinance, that is, uh, uh, vehicles are not in that noise ordinance code. Um, right now, when we try to enforce that, we have to go through the state environmental laws. Um, some of those laws can be up to a $10,000 fine, um, but that requires a noise meter and things. But the, the current noise ordinance, uh, ordinance that we currently have cannot be used for the motorcycles. Okay, thank you. Are there any further questions or comments regarding Bill 62-20 as amended? Seeing none, we will now open the public hearing on Bill number 62-20 as amended. Madam Secretary, do we have any testimony received from members of the public? Uh, no, Madam Chair, we've had no submissions of online written testimony on uh, Bill 6220. Thank you. Uh, we did not have any members of the public sign up to speak on this bill. Therefore, the public hearing on bill number 62-20 as amended is now closed. Madam Secretary, please read the title of bill number 62-20 as amended. Bill number 6220, an ordinance concerning public safety off the road motorcycles. Last call for discussion. Anybody else? Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I am going to support this bill. I appreciate Councilman Prusky bringing this forward. Uh, sorry, Nathan Bolke District. I started, I should have said that. Um, I just want to make it clear in case uh, I have any constituents or anyone who asks why I would have voted for this. Uh, I think it's a very narrowly tailored bill. I think Councilman Prusky has tried to hone in on the exact issue and, and sort of use the scalpel as opposed to the machete. Um, I also appreciate Major Passman's comments that the police department is going to use the first uh, efforts that they can with individuals who are not in compliance with this new code section, uh, assuming it passes, that it'll be educational as opposed to punitive in nature. And I, I appreciate that. I think that's uh, probably what's needed in some ways, but this gives the teeth for the repetitive um, non-compliant individual to allow the police department to actually take action to help our citizens. So um, I thank you, Councilman Prusky. I know this is an issue in my district as well, and I appreciate Major Passman your additional comments. So. Is there any further discussion at this time? Seeing none, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on bill number 62-20 as amended. Ms. Radvian? Aye. Ms. Hare? Aye. Ms. Lacey? Aye. Mr. Volke? Aye. Mr. Prusky? Aye. Ms. Fiedler? Aye. Ms. Pickard? Aye. Seven in the affirmative, none in the negative. Bill number 6220 is passed. Madam Secretary, please read the title of bill number 6320 as amended. Bill number 6320, an ordinance concerning licenses and registrations, electronic, electronic smoking devices in restaurants, indoor prohibition. Mr. Prusky, tonight's your night. This is your bill. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, again, thank you for the council for your patience in trying to get this right. Uh, initially, we had uh, the police department enforcing this, but it's actually under the Department of Health. And some folks were on vacation, but we got it straightened out. The, the bigger piece is this. Um, when the uh, Clean Air Act and other legislation, state and local, were passed, cigars, pipe tobacco, other use of tobacco were listed. As you know, uh, electronic cigarettes are a new 
uh, uh, type of, of device and, and for smoking. And uh, I initially got a complaint from a constituent that actually went to go eat uh, in a restaurant. And uh, we looked up the code and uh, it is allowable currently um, if the establishment uh, does allow that. I wanna be clear, this does not prevent though uh, restaurants from having smoking areas outside other things. This is indoor, clear, and it aligns with the current law. So I just wanna make sure everyone's clear on that. Um, and that's the point that, um, you know, from that inside indoor atmosphere, that this would go along with those things that are there. So thank you so much, and I ask for your support. Mr. Barron, would the administration like to respond at this time? Thank you, Madam Chair Pete Barron with the administration. Joining me at the virtual table is Mr. Curdian from Health and Ms. Kenny from the Office of Law. Uh, just to reiterate uh, what the sponsor said, uh, we appreciate uh, his work and, and everybody that was involved in, in getting this bill right. Health is the right place for this um, rule to live. Uh, and uh, we appreciate the amendment that was adopted on September 21st, which brings this uh, bill into line. Therefore, the administration wholeheartedly supports and asks the council to pass the bill uh, this evening. Happy to answer any questions that uh may the council may have are there any questions from the council seeing none we will now open the public hearing on bill 63-20 as amended madam secretary do we have any testimony received from members of the public uh, no madam chair we've received no submissions of online written testimony on bill 63-20 we did not have any members of the public sign up to speak. Therefore, the public hearing on bill number 63-20 as amended is now closed. Madam Secretary, please read the title of bill number 63-20 as amended. Bill number 6320, an ordinance concerning licenses and registrations, electronic smoking devices in restaurants, indoor prohibition. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on bill number 63-20 as amended. Ms. Rodvian? Aye. Ms. Hare? Aye. Ms. Lacey? Aye. Mr. Volke? Aye. Mr. Prusky? Aye. Ms. Fiedler? Aye. Ms. Pickard? Aye. Seven in the affirmative, none in the negative. Bill number 6320 is passed. Madam Secretary, please read the title of bill number 66-20. Bill number 6620, an ordinance concerning current expense budget, supplementary appropriations, capital budget and program fund transfer. Thank you, this is an administration bill. Mr. Barron, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I have a number of people joining me at the virtual table. Uh, Pete Barron with the administration. Joining me from budget in, is Mr. Taru and Ms. Karen, Ms. Carrington. Uh, from finance, Ms. McQuaid. From health, Ms. Penley. Uh, from the sheriff, uh, Chief Deputy Tui, And from law, uh, Ms. Blair Klausmeyer. Um, Bill 6620 was discussed at the work session. It is the first quarter budget transfer bill. Uh, section one recognizes $769,000 of revenue received from sources not anticipated in the budget in the grants and special revenue fund. None of these grants require a county match. Section two recognizes a little over 1.3 million of revenue received from the U.S. Housing and Urban Development's Emergency Solutions Grant, which will go into the Community Development Fund. It does not require a county match. The third section corrects a funding source from the capital budget for uh, applicable projects the, for Pasadena road improvements, for Route 2 road improvements, and for the Maryland 214 Lock Haven Road capital projects. To be clear, uh, none of these projects will get more money. None of these projects will get less money. It is just uh, reallocating uh, where the funding's coming from. Uh, we are happy to answer any questions 
um, and I have uh, our experts here to help me. So with that, we ask that you pass the bill today. Thank you. Are there any questions from the council? Seeing none, we will now open the public hearing on bill number 66-20. Madam Secretary, do we have any testimony received from members of the public? No, Madam Chair, we've received no submissions of uh, online written testimony on Bill 6620. Thank you. And we did not have any members of the public sign up to speak. Therefore, the public hearing on Bill Number 66-20 is now closed. Madam Secretary, please read the title of Bill Number 66-20. Bill Number 6620, an ordinance concerning current expense budget, supplementary appropriations, capital budget and program fund transfer. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on bill number 66-20. Ms. Rodvian? Aye. Ms. Hare? Aye. Ms. Lacey? Aye. Mr. Volke? Aye. Mr. Prusky? Aye. Ms. Fiedler? Aye. Ms. Pickard? Aye. Seven in the affirmative, none in the negative. Bill number 6620 is passed. Thank you. Madam Secretary, please read the title of bill number 67-20. Bill number 6720, an ordinance concerning flood, floodplain management, erosion and sediment control and stormwater, stormwater management. Thank you. Uh, this is an administration bill. I am a co-sponsor, uh, but I am going to turn this over to Mr. Barron and his team. Mr. Barron, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Joining me from the administration, well, first, uh, I'm Pete Barron from the administration. Joining me from the administration is Mr. Johnston uh, from DPW, Mr. Michelson from INP, uh, Mr. Africa and Mr. Badami, and from law, Ms. Kenny. Um, this bill, uh, Bill 6720, is the result of a lot of work by the Stormwater Work Group. Uh, stormwater management is a critical issue facing many communities. And, and while this bill won't fix every issue no bill does, it is a critical change to the code uh, that will help make sure our future stormwater systems work. This is a, a promise that the county executive uh, made uh, when he was running for office. Uh, that we would take steps to address um, issues like this. I, and, and I want to thank uh, especially Councilwoman Pickard, uh, who has contributed greatly to the work of the work group. Um, this work group uh, uh, began with meetings uh, with stakeholders from the, the development community, from HOAs, uh, from DPW, OPZ, Office of Law. It was, it was put together by inspection and permits, and, and they really did a lot of the heavy lifting here to discuss uh, issues of concern, identify recommendations, and, and develop an action plan. Um, this bill will revise our code to extend the length of, a to length of time of a sediment and erosion control plan approval from two years to three years, as is in state law. It adds a two-year warranty for certain stormwater management facilities owned or maintained by HOAs after completion. The two-year warranty is one of the work group's recommendations. Uh, it requires developers, applicants to post a warranty and security to correct any deficiencies that occur within the war warranty period. Um, so with that, we're, we ask that you uh, pass this bill and, and we're happy to answer any questions you may have at this time. Thank you. Are there any questions regarding Bill 67-20? Ms. Hare. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jessica Hare, District 7. Um, my questions are less with the bill itself and more on the fiscal impact that was noted. The auditor's letter notes that um, IMP is going to ask for two additional environmental control inspectors in the next budget and a couple of uh, vehicles, I believe, to go with this. And I'm I'm trying to figure out how we arrived at that, um, that we need two more inspectors to handle this workload of, of just extending this warranty period. Mr. Barron. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, great question, Councilman Hare. And, and um, you know, as as with all department departmental requests for for new positions, um, the need for new positions will be evaluated as part of the FY22 budget. Uh, this request will be evaluated holistically, and in in looking at all of the functions with IMP, uh, a holistic approach ensures we are adding resources only after utilize, utilizing our existing resources as efficiently as possible. Uh, Mr. Africa and, and, and the folks at IMP um, are, are definitely gonna ask for more positions. As we all know, uh, county resources are, are stretched and, um, but just because they're asked for, it doesn't mean that uh, the administration will recommend them. And it definitely doesn't mean that the council uh, as the final fiscal authority will, will grant them. So uh, we do recognize that there is a, some increased in workload with this and, and it may require a, a further request, but we do not, um, we are, the administration is not committing to new positions at this time. Okay, thank you. That last sentence was helpful. Uh, Jessica Hare, District 7. So that's that's helpful. So this is what IMP stated, but the administration is not necessarily taking this position, that those two positions are necessary to accomplish the work in this bill. We are going to analyze this holistically. I, I, I'm not saying that we won't come and grant Mr. Africa's request if he asks for them, but uh, at this time, no, we are not committing to new positions. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions, oh, Ms. Hare, uh, Ms. Fiedler? Thank you, Madam Chair, Amanda Fiedler, District 5. This isn't a question, but I just want to thank the work group and um, all parties involved. I know there were uh, District 5 constituents who have been involved um, for years, actually, and this is a significant step in the right direction. So I just want to thank all, all the folks who were involved in putting this together. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, we will now open the public hearing on bill number 67-20. Madam Secretary, do we have any testimony received from members of the public? Uh, no, Madam Chair, we've received no submissions of online written testimony on bill 67-20. Thank you. We did not have any members of the public sign up to speak. The public hearing on bill number 67-20 is now closed. Madam Secretary, please read the title of bill number 67-20. Bill number 6720, an ordinance concerning floodplain management, erosion and sediment control, and stormwater management, stormwater management. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? I will take this time as uh, Allison Pickard Chair District 2 to thank the work group and the administration, um, all parties involved. It's been a fun time on that work group. I know the work group uh, will stay in place, I believe, Mr. Johnston, is that correct? Because this is just one part, uh, this just solves one part of the problem. And I know in my district, um, we've had some significant issues. While this isn't retroactive, I look forward to this being a good policy going forward. So thank you everybody for the hard work. And I look forward to that next stormwater management stakeholder meeting. <laughs> Uh, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on bill number 67-20. Ms. Ronvian? Aye. Ms. Hare? Aye. Ms. Lacey? Aye. Mr. Volke? Aye. Mr. Prusky? Aye. Ms. Fiedler? Aye. Ms. Pickard? Aye. Seven in the affirmative, none in the negative, bill number 67-20 is passed. Madam Secretary, please read the title of bill number 68-20. Bill number 68-20, an ordinance concerning finance, taxation, and budget, admission and amusement tax, zoning, farm alcohol production facility. Thank you. This is an administration bill. Mr. Barron, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Pete Barron with the administration uh, joining me at the table is our, our Deputy Chief Administrative Officer for Land Use, Ms. Laurie Rhodes, uh, uh, from the Office of Finance, Ms. McQuaid, and from the Office of Law, Ms. Kenny. 
Uh, first, I want to start out with a, a bit of a disclosure. As, as many of you are aware, uh, the county executive uh, as, a, um, as a farmer, he, he comes from farming, his uh, family, and he has an interest in a uh, land trust. That land trust um, has a tenant, which is a winery on the farm. The county executive does not have a financial interest in the winery. Um, Bill 6820 eliminates the separate conditional uses of breweries and wineries on farms and creates a new broader conditional use category that would allow all types of alcohol production that can occur on farms. It encompasses best practices by Maryland and Virginia jurisdictions that regulate this use. The bill provides regulations that are predictable and consistent so that the farm alcohol industry can plan for this use accordingly. It also includes protections to mitigate adverse impacts for non-farmers whose property may adjoin this use. This bill was brought to the administration by the Agricultural Farming and Agritourism Commission and the administration supports this bill. Mr. Pruski. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a question for the administration. Um, I noticed that farm breweries and wineries are listed. As you know, I've been a big advocate and we had a bill approved from the Council for Distilleries. Is there any uh, objection? And again, I know it's not this bill. I don't plan on putting an amendment, but in the future, that distilleries would also be added uh, to this section. Uh, again, it's, I'm just looking at from what I see. I just want to make sure that, that that would be the case. Mr. Barron. Thank you, Madam Chair. Pete Barron uh, with the administration. Uh, we would be happy to engage in that conversation. Uh, a lot of work went into getting this right. So uh, I can commit that the administration would put the same level of work on, on that issue to, to, to see if it would work. Madam Chair, as a follow-up, sorry, Councilwoman here. I just like to be added as a co-sponsor to this bill. Um, for those of you that don't know, when I uh, introduced the, uh, Councilman Prusky, by the way, sorry. Um, that introduced the distillery bill. Uh, I also voted for the farm brewery bill prior. One of the concerns that a lot of people don't understand is the capital needed to do such these projects. It's quite hefty and amazing. It's not something that any old average person could do, um, even with economic uh, help uh, through financing, bonding, state, whatever else. So certainly I think this is a good way to encourage that. And that's why I managed the distillery piece. But I would, uh, Madam Secretary, like to be added as a co-sponsor to this bill. Thank you. Ms. Hare. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jessica Hare, District 7. I have a couple of questions just because I've received um, quite a number of emails about this, and I think there are some misconceptions related to what this bill allows and what it doesn't allow and, and what it's actually doing. So I'm hoping um, perhaps, Ms. Rhodes, you can help uh, with a few of these questions just so that the general public understands. Um, and, and I guess maybe the best way to go about it is I understand this bill to um, make a broader definition, as Mr. Barron said, of the farm alcohol production, but it's not allowing more wineries or breweries than already were allowable under the code. Is that accurate? Lori Rhodes, that is accurate. It is consolidating all of the farm alcohol production under one use category instead okay. of regulating them separately. Perfect. And so that creates, we talked about this a little bit with the with the bill that I had related to breweries and wineries in the past. That creates sort of an automatic parity so that the breweries and the wineries are are treated the same. Is that fair? Exactly. Because there were some differences. Again, Lori Rhodes, there were some differences in the code between how we were regulating wineries versus breweries. Okay. So this would be one use category with all of the same conditions applying to meadery, brewery, distillery, etc. Okay, great. And so, um, in fact, I think even we're adding some additional restrictions or conditions in this bill that that were not present in the current requirements for wineries and breweries. Um, and I'm speaking specifically with respect to the parking requirements. Is that we've increased the parking requirements? Is that correct? Lori Rhodes, yes, we did add parking requirements, whereas before it was based on a parking need study. And these parking requirements came from a lot of research. We looked at Loudoun County, Virginia, Charles County, um, as well as Carroll County to kind of see, find a middle ground because we don't want a lot of impervious surface on these farms. And so we found that to be a reasonable 
amount of parking for this use. Okay, so, so do you view this as, um, I mean, I don't see this as a large expansion over what's already allowed, but I just wanna make sure that you agree with me because I there's only a handful of, of wineries um, in, in the county. Do you see this as suddenly there's gonna be 300 of them um, that pop up because of this legislation? Glory Roads. Again, supply and demand is gonna keep this use in check. The startup cost is very expensive as Councilwoman Fiedler knows from her constituent. Uh, we still have not received uh, a farm brewery. Uh, there are a couple of breweries that are pending, but they have not come forth with a site development plan applications. And we only have three or maybe four wineries. So no, I do not see many, many more coming forth. Okay, thank you very much. I don't have any other questions. Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Nathan Volke, District 3. Um, Ms. Rhodes, I understand the balance that you sound like you were trying to find pervious versus non-impervious surface uh, with the parking requirements. How did you arrive at the one space per five attendees for an outdoor event as being that appropriate balance? Actually, I visited um, Lori Rhodes. I visited the Great Frogs Winery in Annapolis, and I noticed how they were handling their parking. It wasn't overparked, and the floor area was pretty, you know, in my opinion, substantial from what other wineries I've visited. And they did not have a lot of parking space spaces there, so I would, didn't want to overpark the shoes. The other alternative would have been a parking needs study, which is how it's done currently, where they're comparing similar uses to come up with um, parking spaces. Again, I looked at best practices from a lot of jurisdictions where wineries are more, um, there are more wineries in those areas. Okay, thank you. Nathan Volpe, District 3. So just to follow up, it's your opinion that the one space per five attendees will satisfy the parking requirements as well, if not better than the parking needs study currently in, in yes. effect? Yes, it okay. was a balance between the public needs and looking at best practices from other jurisdictions who have many more wineries than we do in Anne Arundel County. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair. Sir. Thank you. Nathan Volke, District 3 again. Um, I, I don't know if this question is for the Office of Law or for Mr. Barron, but I did want to ask about the county executive's interest in a winery because I appreciate Mr. Barron putting that on in the beginning. Um, I was curious, has the county executive completed an apparent conflict of interest form uh, with respect to this legislation? Because I'm not clear on how, if he benefits from a land trust and the land trust has a tenant on the land who's paying, um, I understand, I think it's a close family member of his who may be involved with the winery, but if they're paying rent and that benefits the land trust, I'm not clear how the county executive doesn't have a pecuniary interest in this winery. Uh, an apparent conflict of interest form was filed. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions or comments regarding Bill 68-20? Seeing none, Madam Secretary, do we have any testimony received from members of the public? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, we have had three submissions of online written testimony, which was shared with the council and posted on the county website. I should have said we will now open the public hearing on bill number 6820, and we will now hear from members of the public who signed up ahead of time. We do have nine people signed up to speak on this bill. Remarks will be limited to two minutes. When it is your turn to speak, um, Please unmute yourself and begin by stating your name and address for the record. We will begin with Mr. Kevin Addix. Mr. Addix, are you with us this evening? I am. Can you hear me? Yes. State your name and address for the record, and you have two minutes. Good evening. Thank you very much. Kevin Addix with Grow and Fortify. Uh, address is 819 West Pedonia Road in Cockeysville, Maryland, 21030. Uh, my firm represents the Maryland Wineries Association, the Brewers Association of Maryland, and the Maryland Distillers Guild. We represent uh, all craft beverage producers in the state, including a number in Anne Arundel County. And we've been uh, working at the, the level of the uh, Agriculture Commission uh, all the way up to, um, and, and speaking uh, on all levels of this bill draft, 
and I'm very pleased with the compromises that are built in. Um, not everybody's thrilled with them, but uh, that that is just a testament to the fact that this has been worked through and uh, the parking is an example of that. Um, we, it is our understanding that uh, farm wine, farm beer, farm cider, farm mead, and farm spirits are all included in this because the legislation does uh, speak to the state's definition of what farm alcohol producer is through a piece of legislation that was passed uh, in the 2020 legislative session. And I will express one concern about the legislation that I would ask for your consideration about, and that is when a farm alcohol producer attempts to locate on a private road, the way the bill language reads, uh, there must be an affidavit from every member of the community on that private road, allowing for the alcohol producer to get started. And that is a, a burden unlike anything we've seen elsewhere. We've seen in other counties, uh, special exception processes where there are hearings and concerns may come about and conditions may be placed upon the alcohol producer. But the idea that one neighbor um, and neighbors can go deep in rural areas, that one neighbor could have veto power over a farmer's interest in, in starting up a new venture is concerning to the industry. And we would ask for your consideration on a, a change to that portion of the bill. But beyond that, we very much support this legislation and uh, thank you for your support of this burgeoning industry in the county. Thank you, Mr. Addicts. You ended right as the timer was going off. Um, we will move on to Maria Nowakowski. Are you here, Ms. Nowakowski? Maria Nowakowski. Okay, we will we will circle back and see if she joins. Uh, we'll move forward to Mr. Martin Nowakowski. Are you with us, Mr. Nowakowski? Okay. Well, we'll move to Ms. Anna Cheney. Ms. Anna Cheney, have you joined us? Yes, I have. Ms. Cheney, uh, please state your name and address for the record, and you have two minutes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Anna Cheney. My address is 5801 Brookswood Road in Lothian, Maryland at Honey's Harvest Farm. And I just wanted to offer my support and request yours as well for this bill. As the, I'm, I'm testifying on behalf of myself, but as being involved as the chairperson for the Agriculture, Farming, and Agritourism Commission, I can tell you that this was well vetted out over quite a long period of time with all the agencies of the county, with people like Kevin, who I, uh, I look to as an expert in this field, who's been in it for many years, and looking at other jurisdictions, I feel that this was very well thought, thought through, and by making it congruent for all the different types of alcohol production that are allowable on farms, I feel it's much more fair and equitable to the community at large and also to the farmer who's going through these processes. And so thank you so much. I would just request your support for this bill. And I think that if anything is uh, changed, I would definitely uh, defer to Kevin Addicts as our expert witness. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move to Mr. Gerardo Martinez. Are you here, sir, Mr. Martinez? Don't hear Mr. Martinez. Ms. Monique Larson. Ms. Monique Larson, are you joined us this evening for Bill 6820? Mr. Adam Cottrell, are you here with us this evening? Yes, I'm here. Hello. Mr. Cottrell, you please state your name and address for the record and you have two minutes. Yes, my name is Adam Cottrell. I'm at 540 West Bayfront over here in Lothian. Uh, I'm a first generation mixed uh, vegetable organic farmer. Uh, we've been at it five years. We've got a really good following through the community. 
And uh, our biggest barrier is enough land to scale to a certain size to feed enough people and to generate, you know, um, a living wage for me and my wife. Uh, it's been pretty challenging to find a bunch of land that's, you know, I know our area offers five and 10 acre lots. And those are mostly taken over by conventional, which isn't very profitable, but, you know, and offering much to these landlords of owners of property. And uh, I feel like, you know, it's pretty easy to throw your stuff up uh, when you're ready to sell it because you don't know how to make money from your land or there's so many restrictions from doing so. Uh, for someone like me and a lot like me coming up as young farmers, there's going to be a really big push of young farmers coming with no land for them to farm. And uh, if it's too easy to give developers the land, uh, we need to be able to create incomes from the farm until these young farmers come up to age or maturity or, you know, accessibility. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it's the best thing to do to offer as many incomes for farms and owners so that we can keep this ownership in the family's hands that can continue to keep it uh, preserved in a more forward way. You know, uh, maybe not signing it into ag preservation, which is also a good thing, but making sure that they can pay their bills so that then I can find them and use their land. So uh, I think anything to add some value to the land for the Pearson that is maybe owned it for many generations to continue doing so uh, would give me, you know, would knock out the only barrier that I have. So cheers. Yeah. That's thank my you, list. sir. You thank you, sir, for your testimony. Next on my list is Mr. Brian Riddle. Mr. Riddle, have you joined us this evening? I'm here. Mr. Riddle, please state your name and address for the record, and you have two minutes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Brian Riddle, and I reside at 2417 Fox Creek Lane in Davidsonville. And I, on this particular bill, would just like to extend my support and uh, request this council proceed with 6820. Uh, this effort has been vetted uh, extensively with our commission as the vice chair of the Agricultural and Farming and Ag Tourism Commission has uh, taken a lot of consideration into this recommendation and uh, I support the administration's um, bill as proposed and encourage you to support it. Thank you. The last uh, person on my list is Mr. Dale Clark. Have you joined us this evening? Mr. Dale Clark. Hello, I'm here. <laughs> Hi, please state your name and address for the record and you have two minutes. Uh, my name is Dale Clark and our farm is at 6027 Fisher Station Road, Lothian, Maryland. And I just wish to um, give my support to this bill 68020 on behalf of all the work that has been done by the Ag Commission. And for those reasons stated earlier by Anna and Mr. Riddle. So I'd like to ask you to consider support for that for that bill. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Uh, I'm going to ask one more time if the Nowakowskis have joined us this evening. Are the Nowakowskis in the house? Uh, Mr. Martinez. or Ms. Larson. Seeing, not, seeing that they're not here, I believe this council has moved through some legislation quickly tonight and maybe folks had planned for a later, later hearing on this bill. The public hearing on bill number 68-20 is now closed. Madam Secretary, please read the title of bill number 68-20. Bill number 6820, an ordinance concerning finance, taxation, and budget, admission and amusement tax, zoning, farm alcohol production facility. Is there any further discussion at this time? Ms. Fiedler. Thank you, Madam Chair, Amanda Fiedler, District 5. This question is either for Ms. Rhodes or the administration. Um, 
I heard Mr. Addix uh, make a comment about the special exception versus the affidavit for support for private roads. Can you just share why um, it was determined to go with the affidavit versus special exception? Oh. Tory Rhodes, um, he, he didn't mention special exception. We're allowing uh, farm alcohol production as a conditional use as we currently do for uh, farm breweries and wineries. The concern that he expressed was for the affidavit for from each owner that shares a private road for this use. Um, he has concerns about that because one owner could hold up the whole process if they don't sign on to agree to allow that private road to be used. Uh, this, this requirement was a compromise based on concerns from residents currently about the use of private roads for these commercial like events. And so that's why we wanted to keep that in there and to open it up and not relegate these uses just to the periphery of a neighborhood like the current code does, which requires that you have direct access on a collector or higher road. So this is a compromise to say, you can be on a public road. However, if you're on a private road, let's protect those individuals that may have lots that are in the interior of that private road. So, so that's why we had this um, condition in the code. Thank you. I appreciate that information. Are there any questions or comments regarding Bill 68-20? Okay, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on Bill number 68-20. Ms. Radvian? Aye. Ms. Hare? Aye. Ms. Lacey? Um, just briefly, um, I think this is a neat idea to bring our code um, up to up to speed with some other leading jurisdictions and broadening the term of farm alcohol production. Um, I do have a concern that similar to what I've had with other bills about um, affidavits and whether or not such affidavits where um, adjoining property owners are giving consent for a use, uh, whether there is any procedure for those affidavits to be recorded. And while I don't think um, it is necessary at this time in this bill to, to try to um, I, I support the bill. I don't think it's necessary to amend it right now, um, but I think it, that issue should be considered so that uh, you know subsequent potential purchasers are put on adequate notice of the agreements that have been made and uh, essentially easements that have been created. So with that, I vote. I vote aye. Mr. Volke. Uh, just briefly, thank you. Uh, similar to Councilwoman Lacey, I have some concerns about this bill too particularly about the amount of land that it opens up to these potential commercial activities and doing this outside of the general development plan. But with that said, I do think that there is a very compelling reason to try and allow these farms uh, and farmers to find a way to continue to protect their land from development. So with that, I'll vote aye. Mr. Frusky? Aye. Ms. Fiedler? Aye. Ms. Pickard? Aye. Seven in the affirmative, none in the negative. Bill 6820 is passed. Madam Secretary, please read the title of Bill number 69-20. Bill number 6920, an ordinance concerning zoning, farm or agricultural heritage site stays and special events. This is also an administration bill. Mr. Barron, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, Pete Barron with the administration. Joining me is our Deputy CAO for Land Use, Ms. Lori Rhodes, and from Office, Ms. Kelly Kenny, or from the Office of Law, excuse me, Ms. Kelly Kenny. Um, uh, to reiterate uh, the same ethics disclosure uh, I made in, in 6820, the county executive uh, is a farmer has an interest in a land trust that has a farm and on that farm there is a, uh, a, a winery but he has no financial interest in the winery and apparent conflict of interest form was filed on this bill as well. Um, thank you Mr. Volke for, for uh, allowing me to clarify that on the previous bill. Um, 
Bill 6920 creates and allows the use of the uses of farmer agricultural heritage site stays and farmer agricultural heritage site special events as either an extension of a temporary use conditional or special exemption use stays will be treated similar to bed and breakfast use. However, thresholds are set for the number of attendees. The treatment of special events is determined by the number of annual events and lot size, a significant amount of time, research, collaboration, and negotiation from many stakeholders was necessary to craft this bill. 69-20 allows farms to continue the occasional events that many have done for years without additional regulatory burden, but requires new conditions and even special exception pro approval for the more frequent events. I think that's important to understand. Uh, the county executive believes that the three-tiered approach to these new upper limits is a reasonable framework to protect neighbors from potential negative impacts of these activities. He understands from personal experience that any regulatory burden on a farm operation is, is, is rarely welcomed, but in our county, our farms are surrounded by residential communities and being a good neighbor matters. Uh, keeping agricultural, keeping agriculture commercially viable has been a directive of every county general development plan uh, supported by overwhelming majorities of our residents. Um, we all love open space and we, we love live nearing, living near farms um, and, and agritourism is only a small piece of the solution uh, to, to helping our farms uh, and agricultural um, heritage stay viable. A as with Bill 6820, it, it includes many protections to mitigate adverse impacts for properties that may adjoin these uses. Uh, this bill was brought to the administration by the Agricultural Farming and Agritourism Commission and the administration supports this bill. We understand um, that, that we expect to see some amendments and, and we'll comment on those at the appropriate time. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions and, and we support this bill. Thank you. Are there any questions of the council? Competing, competing flags. Mr. Volke, you have the floor. Mine's not so much a question yet, but I just wanted to comment in a moment of levity. Um, my three-year-old likes to watch Old McDonald a lot. And as Mr. Barron was giving his intro in one of probably the unanticipated but best lines of the year um, he indicated the county executive has a farm and on that farm he has a winery and I couldn't help but sing you know that in my head so anyway just for a brief moment to break things up all right that may or may not have been intentional councilman Volke I refuse to disclose you can tell who on the council has younger children uh Ms. Hare Thank you, Madam Chair. Jessica Hare, District 7. I don't know how I follow that, um, especially with serious questions. Uh, let me just start out by saying I, I think um, this whole concept is a tightrope, right? It's a balancing act. And um, certainly I have spoken with a number of people. This bill obviously has a, a large potential impact on District 7. I've spoken with a number of people who are both for and who have concerns with this bill. And, and it's that balancing line that I would personally really like to find um, to my understanding that the number of farms in the county has been declining over the last several years. I think uh, the last report we had um, at the council sometime in 2019 perhaps um, came from the last ag census that was done and showed about 392 active farms. And that was a pretty significant decline from the prior uh, ag census. So certainly we want to do everything we can to keep farmers farming their property. Um, at the same time, I do have concerns in the, in the vein of being a good neighbor that there may be people who live next to a farm uh, or across the street from a farm or wherever it may be who didn't know when they purchased their property that uh, certain events or certain types of ag tourism might be happening. And, and I want to make sure that we are walking that tightrope. So I do have a couple of amendments that I'll introduce at the appropriate time. But before that, uh, again, Ms. Rhodes, I'm, I'm going to ask you a number of questions and I'm hoping you can help um, with the general public understand what this bill does and what it doesn't do. Um, and, and the first question is sort of a broad, 
a broad question here. Help me understand and help the general public understand what is, how is the special event bill here different from the ag tourism bill in the past? I think it was 2017. Lori Rhodes. Um, the special event bill differs from the agritourism bill because agritourism uh, allows uses that are customarily an incidental accessory to farming. Now, if you remove the farm, you could have a wedding. And so we didn't feel that a wedding would be customarily accessory to farming, which is why we didn't include it and amend the definition of agritourism. Furthermore, state law that enabled agritourism to be defined and regulated by counties removed weddings from the list. So that is one of the primary reasons why we did not include it in agritourism and we created a separate use category. Currently, our code has temporary uses and that's how we would allow these weddings for profit to occur on farms. They would have to reach out to our office and request a temporary use. We would get all the details, the number of people, the lot, so we can put the environmental layers on to see what we're dealing with, where the parking is gonna take place, whether or not fire apparatus could get there. If they're erecting a tent, it, would it be safe? The health department wanted to know about sanitation how it's gonna be catered. That's how we deal with weddings now as a temporary use. There are no limits on that. The temporary use allows um, 60 days of an event. So conceivably someone could schedule a lot of weddings in that 60 days and then request an extension from a planning and zoning officer for two additional 60 days up to 180 days. There were no limits, really no uh, provisions for protecting people from setbacks, noise, hours of operation. It was all vetted internally by the life safe, safety agencies as well as planning and zoning. We actually would have people go out and solicit the neighborhood to get people to say, it's okay, you're having a wedding at this time hours are going to be here. Did you get your liquor license? So there's a lot of conversation that went on before we would authorize a private, I mean, not a private, a for-profit wedding on a farm. And to date, since 2014, we've only had four weddings that we are aware of that actually sought to have authorization from our office. Okay, and I think that leads me right into my next question. It looks like um, from 2017 to 2019, I see in the auditor's letter, there was uh, roughly 22 events annually, and that's countywide. 22 events, but not weddings and parties. I mean, some people ha would have fundraisers. We had uh, a gentleman who was using his goats to eradicate invasive species. I mean, the list is long. Um, you're dealing with the restaurants using the temporary use to use parking lots. Um, so there's a lot of nonprofits that may want to have a temporary use for a fundraising event. So the 22 does not account for all weddings and party events. Those are all different types of temporary uses. The four weddings is what we've had over those number of years. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jessica Hare, District 7. Madam Chair, I'll just keep going unless someone else wants to jump in or may I keep going? You may. I just want to uh, let everybody know that we will be taking a 10-minute recess at the 730 mark. So that's probably, um, we're probably in good shape. So you may continue, Ms. Hare. Thank you very much. Jessica Hare, District 7. Uh, okay, Ms. Rhodes, help me understand then. So it sounds like we're not, we're not touching. This bill doesn't touch sort of the corn mazes of the agritourism. This is really only touching on these special, you know, weddings, uh, birthday parties, retirement parties, what, whatever it may be, special events, uh, farm to table, so to speak. Why is there no limit on capacity 
for the first eight events, but then nine through 15 has a 200 person capacity. Lori Rhodes, because, I mean, because we have been allowing these uses as a temporary use, we had limited number, they're thoroughly vetted. We were gonna keep parity with how we currently would allow these events as a temporary use. Uh, we, we've not had any complaints to my knowledge of the weddings that have occurred. And this would allow someone who wanted to have a wedding on their farm to say, okay, let me try it out and see if this, if, if this is something I want to invest in. Whereas when you have more events as a conditional use and then a special exception use where you have more conditions, we believe that we have had, we have enough vetting in place with how we treat temporary uses that we would continue to do the same with the special events. I mean, it's a discretionary approval by the planning and zoning officer. If we get a complaint, we can send the fire marshal out and they can just shut it down. And of course, people want to be good neighbors because they invest a lot of money and setting up these weddings, having guests there. So they're gonna make sure that they're a good neighbor, that they're, the noise is, is in check. We make sure that they know they need to get a liquor license. So all of those things are taking place before authorization is given. So we didn't have any issues in the past. This was gonna be an extension of what we currently allow, but to make it more predictable for the farms and the heritage sites to know that in addition to temporary uses, which doesn't spell out that you can do weddings and parties, the special events does, but it would just be an extension of the temporary use. Okay, Jessica here, District 7. If I, I this is one area in the bill where I, it's not quite clear to me. If I wanna hold, let's say I'm gonna hold 10 weddings in a year. That's my plan for my farm. Um, and, I submit, I suppose, for that conditional use. Are the first eight weddings, are they unlimited capacity and then weddings nine and 10 are limited to 200? Or because I'm doing 10, are all 10 limited to 200? If this bill passes, if someone wanted to do 10 weddings, we would say you are a conditional use and you would be limited to from nine to 15 and you would have to go through that process. But without the conditional use and or the special exception, we would be determining how many events we would allow as a temporary use within that 60 day period based on the current provisions. Okay. And we've not had anyone who wanted to have 30 weddings in a 60 day period. It's just impossible for the setup and you know, making it presentable and having all the life safety checks and the permits. We've not had anyone come in and ask to do 10, I mean, just one wedding at a time. And it, it could be maybe three months in between, but we've not had the numbers that a lot of people have, are concerned about with this bill. Certainly, so I, maybe I, let me rephrase the question. Let's say in January, I come and ask to have a one day wedding event and it's gonna have 500 people. And then I do the same thing in February, March, April, May, June, July. When I get to month eight, when I get to August and I've held my eight weddings, then when I get to number nine, is that then when the 200 person limit kicks in? In other words, suddenly in September, now I'm limited to 200 people? Well. Lori Rhodes, the farmer or the heritage site would have to make a business decision. And we would sit down and, and have a conversation with them about it, um, about how they want to fit into the code. If you plan on just starting out, maybe having a couple events, seeing if this is something you want to invest in, we would recommend the temporary use, the discretionary approval. If you look at this as something that you may want to do on a recurring basis um, and not have more than 15 events, we would talk about you satisfying the conditional use requirements for the nine to 15 and all of those follow on approvals that needs to be attached to the zoning. That's how we would have that conversation. And then if they wanted to do 16 to 30, 
that kicks you into the special exception where you have to have the pre-file meeting. You have you definitely have to have the site plan for the conditional use and the special exception. We would tell them it's a public hearing. There's specific requirements as well as general requirements that needs to be addressed and discussed in an open meeting. It can be appealed to the Board of Appeals. And if you abandon that use for more than a year, the special exception terminates. So that's how we would have to educate them about the different thresholds and what code would be applicable, what provisions would be applicable to that. Okay, thank you. Jessica Hare, District 7, I, I think maybe I'm misunderstanding and maybe I'm asking my question poorly. If part of my business plan is to come apply for this conditional use because I plan to hold 10 events, um, am I restricted to the conditional requirements for all 10 events or am I unrestricted for the first eight and then only have to meet the conditions for the conditional use for events nine and 10? I'm trying to figure you, out- You, you just, Lori Rhodes, you can't overlap. You can't say I'm gonna have eight and then I'm gonna have nine. And that's why it's a business decision that you have to make. Are you just gonna do a couple and you're gonna, it's gonna be a discretionary approval or are you gonna be nine to 15 doing it on a maybe on an annual basis, nine to 15? And, or do you envision your business expanding? And if it does beyond 15, then you need special exception approval where it's held to that plan based on what was approved by the hearing officer. Okay, that's helpful. Madam Chair, this might be a good breaking point for me. I have a couple more questions, but I wanna be mindful of the time. Thank you. I appreciate that. May I have a motion to recess for 10 minutes? Lacey, so some... move, Bulky. All in favor. Sorry, Madam Vice. Aye. 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 Okay. The motion carries. We will return. Um, we will return back to this council meeting at 7:42. Uh, thank you.
Good evening. It's now 7.42. I'm waiting for all of my colleagues to appear. We will proceed. I believe, Ms. Hare, you still have questions. Madam Secretary, I mean, uh, that's me. Madam Chairman, um, I should call the roll to make sure oh. everyone is here. Yes, my mistake. Please call the roll. Uh, Ms. Rodman? Present. Ms. Hare? Present. Ms. Lacey? Present. Mr. Volke? Present. Mr. Prusky? Here. Ms. Fiedler? Present. Ms. Pickard? Present. Madam Chairman, all council are present. Thank you. Ms. Hare. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jessica Hare, District 7. Uh, Ms. Rhodes, talk to me about how we're defining an accessory use um, for the farm or agricultural heritage site special events. Is it an economic definition? Is it, how are we defining that in terms of the uses? Lori Rhodes, accessory use is defined in the zoning code. And Accessory means a use or structure that customarily is incidental and subordinate to another use or structure. That means it cannot be the primary, the principal use of the lot. Okay, so the way I understand that, uh, Jessica Hare, District 7, again, somebody can't just buy a parcel of RA and call it a farm and not actually do any farming on it and host 30 weddings per year. Um, they, it's under the conditional and special exception, it has to be this accessory use. So the principal use still has to be uh, this farming activity. Is that accurate? Lori Rhodes, that is accurate. It would have to be the principal use would have to be a farm. Okay, thank you. And I asked this question to you via email and I appreciate your answer. So I'm hoping you can answer for the public as well. Help me understand what happens when a piece of property has an ag preservation uh, on it. What, what sort of layer of um, additional approvals or what extra hoops have to be, have to be jumped through uh, between this bill and the ag preservation agreement? Lori Rhodes. I mean, that, that was a lot of information um, that I provided to you, and I actually obtained that from Barbara Polito, who heads up the Agricultural and Woodland Preservation Program. And I can just, I mean, I don't know if you want me to just read it out loud, all of the information that I provided you, but we would submit as one of the reviewing agencies a plan to that agency to review to determine whether or not that use would compromise an agricultural easement. So if they would be another agency that would have to review the conditional use and or special exception use transmittal. But I did get some information and I can just read it to you. It says agricultural preservation agreements allow special occasion event, meaning means a wedding, lifetime milestone event or other cultural or social event subject to the foundation's approval if more than 10 years have elapsed since the easement was recorded in the land records. The local agricultural advisory board provides a written favorable recommendation for the proposed special occasion event area. The proposed special occasion events are not prohibited by any federal, state, or local law or regulation. The proposed special occasion events will not interfere with any federal, state, or local restriction placed on funds used by the foundation to purchase the easement. The proposed special occasion event area, including parking, for the special occasion events does not exceed two acres as shown on a map prepared and certified by a professional land surveyor licensed under Title 15 of the Business Occupations and Professions article 
The foundation approves in writing the location of the proposed special occasion event area. The foundation determines in writing that the proposed special occasion events will not interfere with the agricultural use of the land subject to the easement. Proposed special occasion events will take place in one, a temporary structure, including an enclosed or open canopy or tent or other portable structure erected for a reasonable amount of time to accommodate the special occasion event, an existing building on the land subject to the easement, a farm or open air pavilion, or any other existing structure located on the land subject to the easement and unless required by law, a special occasion event area does not add any new impervious surfaces to the land subject to the easement. An, improved, an approval granted by the foundation under this subsection to a landowner to use a portion of the land subject to an easement to hold special occasion events for commercial purposes automatically terminates on the sale or transfer of the land subject to the easement. Thank you, Jessica here, District 7. I think I have just one last question and I really appreciate all this information. As I mentioned, I'm trying to understand this sort of tightrope that we're walking and this is helpful for me personally because of course we see a map with all the RA, RLD, R1 properties in the county, but then you layer on top of that how many um, you know, have an active a farming plan with the soil conservation district, how many of those might have an ag preservation agreement, which adds that extra layer. And so this is very helpful for me in sort of understanding what the likely impact will be uh, moving forward. It's really helpful to understand that there's been only 22 events on average the last handful of years um, and only four weddings, it sounds like. Um, my last question though refers, uh, is in regards to enforcement. Um, we're talking about people being good neighbors what, how do we enforce, let's say you have this 200 person limit and 300 people show up or, um, you know, you're not, you're the noise, well, the noise ordinance is already in effect otherwise, but um, what happens if you're not supposed to be changing um, the existing topography, but you do, how, how, how is, is that going to work? Enforcement will work the same way it does now. Um, it's complaint driven. Um, and I realize a lot of these events may and probably will take place on weekends. So we would authorize the zoning inspector over time, you know, to visit these sites on the weekend if we get complaints. We're also going to be partnering with um, the fire department, the fire marshal, who also assists us with issues with these types of events. So. Enforcement will occur the way it does. Um, investigation will occur after a written complaint has been received. And then we'll go from there, whether it's, you know, sending out a citation, a, a, a letter notifying them of the enforcement action, it'll occur the same way that it's regulated under Article 18, Title 17, which is the enforcement section. Okay, thank you very much. And I, I forgot, I'm sorry, I have one more question. Um, Jessica here, District 7. Uh, how in the farm or agricultural heritage site stay, how did we come up with um, five groups of no more than 10 guests in each group? Because that seems like a lot of people. Five with, you're, you're talking about the stays, five groups with no more than 10. That was a discussion back and forth with the Agricultural Commission about what those numbers would be. Of course, this bill, like any other bill, we're gonna be monitoring this because we have gotten a lot of interest. And if we find that there are issues, of course, we can amend that number, but that was a compromise between like how many people can fit in a Airstream and you might have four, four or five Airstreams. We wanted to put a number on it instead of leaving it open just to say five groups of how many? 20, 30 people. So 10 was a, a reasonable number for the amount of acreage that we envision this use to be located on. Keep in mind also that if they have more than five events for farm stays, if they have more than five stays, they're going to be required to obtain a campground license from the state, which lists 
a lot of criteria that it has to be met. Sanitation, um, there's a host of uh, requirements that must be met to have more than five events on the property, more than five stays, I'm sorry, on the property. Okay, but theoretically, before they reach that five stays, there could be 50 people at one time for two straight weeks, five times on a 10 acre property? Let me look at that real quick. So it's five groups of 10 for 14 days. Yes. With the special exception, the hearing officer would grant a number of stays that would be allowed by law. So if it's five groups of 10 for 14 days, then that that would be the number. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate everyone's patience with all my questions. Mr. Bolke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Nathan Bolke, District 3. Um, Ms. Rhodes, you may be the person to answer this or maybe somebody else, I'm not sure, but I am curious. So I look at the fiscal note that indicates that there is no expected fiscal impact from this bill, but then you just noted a few minutes ago in response to some questions from Councilwoman Hare, that there could be overtime for some inspectors um, that's needed because some of these activities will be taking place on weekends uh, when inspectors are then going to need overtime. So I guess I'm, I'm, I'm not sure who the appropriate person is to answer the question, but how did we determine that this bill has no fiscal impact if we're already anticipating that we could be out there on weekends uh, doing inspections and paying overtime? Lori Rhodes. I can only anticipate that that will happen. Again, we have not had any complaints with the weddings that have come forth for temporary use. So I don't believe we will be using overtime pay, but we do have that pay factored in our budget. And if it was necessary for us to use it, we may not use it on inspectors. We could have a police who actually would not be have to pay overtime. We partner with other agencies to make sure we enforce the code. So it wouldn't necessarily have to be an inspector being paid overtime. We can actually ask a police officer who has that area to go out and take a look. Okay, thank you. Nathan Bulky, District 3 again. So are there currently any fees for permits that are being paid in association with these uses at this time? Lori Rhodes, the only fees that I'm aware of that would be paid would be for the to erect the tent. You know, okay. The tent, a one day license, but the fees would be the fees that the farmer would incur for holding these events, having to pay a caterer, having to rent porta potties and thing, things of that nature. But it would be the, the fee for the to erect the tent. Okay, thank you, Ms. Rhodes. Um, Nathan Volke, District 3 again. So there was one line, in, and it's a concern that I have about this bill, um, sort of the overnight stays, if you will, the, um, the site stays, as you're calling them. Um, and I note that in the legislative summary, it talks about on page two, the idea that these stays are really not supposed to be a bed and breakfast in, it's not supposed to be a bed and breakfast home or any kind of short-term residential rental. It's intended that it's camping in tents or in RVs. Um, is there anything in the bill that limits this type of uh, site stay only to tents or RVs? Because I, I didn't see it, but I could have missed it. And I just am concerned that we're going to wind up with, you know, sort of renovated farmhouses on farms that are now accommodating, you know, a lot of people. I don't know how big the farmhouses are, but I, I guess you'd be limited by the size of what you have there. Lori Rhodes, we... We did not put any specific types of tents, airstreams, uh, anything that could be used to house individuals outside because we wanted to allow the farmer the freedom to use the type of things that are popular for, this, for these types of stays. But yes, they will require health department approval. So we're going to have that agency looking at how these individuals are staying on outside and whether or not that's safe. Okay, thank you. Nathan Bulky, District 3 again. So Ms. Rhodes, if a farmer 
already has a farmhouse on site that has bedrooms, bathrooms, everything like that, and it's in working order and good condition, would it be an acceptable use for that farmer to um, sort of use that home or that property at this point for these site stays? I would have to, you know, defer that to the health department to answer that question, and they're not on the panel tonight. I mean, this use is is different, separate and distinct from bed and breakfast in terms of the bed and breakfast being inside of the home, whereas this is allowing the stays to be outside of the home, but they're still going to be subject to the same life safety and health reviews as if they were staying inside of the home. Okay, thank you. And Nathan Bolke, District 3. So I guess kind of my last follow up. I know you keep saying that the stays are outside of the home. Um, and again, I may have missed this in the bill, but I didn't see. Is it required that the stays are outside of a home? It was intended for these stays to be outside of the home because the other option would just be a bed and breakfast. If you're going to be inside sure. of the home, you're going to be a bed and breakfast home or you're going to be a bed and breakfast in by special exception. Based on but the does it of does it sure do, does it say anywhere in the legislation that the stays have to be outside of a home structure? I could add to this, Kelly Kenny, supervising county attorney. It, it, this is actually I think this question is answered in the definition of the farm stay because it says, as Miss Rhodes um, indicated, um, the definition says that it does not include include a bed and breakfast in or bed and breakfast home. So if they were staying in the homes, then that that would be a different use than the farm stay use. Then it would become a bed and breakfast, and it would be subject to the conditions that are imposed on those. Okay, thank you, Ms. Kenny, Nathan Bulky, District Three. So I guess it's almost like the inverse of what's not there, more or less, as as opposed to what's there. It's kind of the fact that it's saying that's not an allowable use is what's indicating that it has to be outside. Um, I, I suppose my question would be, is there any opposition maybe from either Office of Planning and Zoning or anybody else on the panel to the idea that we expressly say in here the stay must be outside as opposed to this sort of interpretation uh, situation? Lori Rhodes, again, this was something that the the Agricultural Commission was seeking based on the popularity of wanting to have that farm experience outside of a home. So this is just a zoning tool that allows them to either reside in, in the home and go through the bed and bre breakfast process or in an Airstream tent or whatever ever, uh, type of structure that would satisfy the health department requirement to, to have the outside experience for farm stays. Okay. All right. Thanks very much. I guess that's the best I'm going to get tonight. Um, thank you all for the answering the questions. Are there any more comments or questions on Bill 69-20 at this time? Seeing none, we will now open the public hearing for Bill number 69-20. Madam Secretary, do we have any testimony received from members of the public? Yes, Madam Chair, we've had 13 submissions of uh, written online testimony, which was shared with the council and posted on the county council website, county website. Thank you. We will now hear from members of the public who signed up ahead of time. We have 19 people signed up to speak on this bill. Remarks will be limited to two minutes. When it is your turn, please unmute yourself and begin by stating your name and address for the record. We will begin this evening with Ms. Sarah Campbell. Ms. Campbell, are you with us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Great, thanks. So this is Sarah Campbell at 4956 Muddy Creek Road in West River, Maryland. Um, I am a farmer and I support Bill 6920 and I am requesting the council's support on it as well. I raise pasture-based meats on my family farm and sell directly to consumers. I believe that this bill will help family farms survive while creating opportunities for people to experience farms in the county and develop a greater appreciation for them. I farm on my family farm and I started farming when my family was at a crossroads. Basically the farm could either be sold 
likely to a developer or farmed if someone in the family wanted to farm it. And I grew up on a farm. I love South County. And I started farming simply because I didn't want this farm to stop being farmland. I want to keep farming, but I'm also realistic and experienced enough to know that agricultural production alone won't be enough to sustain the farm and provide for my family and me long-term, and that I need to find a way to generate more revenue on the farm. And agritourism is a great way to do this. Um, it would help diversify the farm income, um, provide some great risk management. And I think that this bill will help small farms, particularly those who sell directly to consumers or who don't grow traditional commodity crops. I want to be able to offer farm stays or what I like to call glamping, uh, so glamorous camping. So my plan would be to renovate like a vintage camper or two and provide seasonal accommodations and a really intimate farm experience. People who want to come and stay at the farm and learn more about agriculture. Uh, being able to generate additional revenue for this would help the farm be a more viable business and it would help people connect to the farmland. Farming is my first priority. I am hearing that folks have some concerns about this, this legislation, but really, you know, farm stays for farmers like me, they're appealing because they will help generate income on the farm without significantly impacting the land or the community or changing our focus, which is production agriculture. And I am a member of the County Agritourism Commission, and I just want to note that this bill was drafted after looking at other states and counties that offer similar opportunities. And I've talked to farmers who have incorporated this into their business model, and they all speak really positively to the experience. It's helped them in terms of revenue, it brings dollars to other small businesses in the area, like restaurants and cafes, and it makes people more attentive and committed to preserving rural and farm communities because they now have a personal connection to them because they spend time there. And I think that this bill will help our agricultural community thrive, which ultimately preserves farms and rural landscapes, which is the goal here. Thank and you, Ms. Campbell. I believe your two minutes are up. I believe I heard the timer. Thanks. Um, thank you so much. Um, just to note, Madam Secretary, I am having a hard time hearing that timer. Um, I want to make sure that I'm fair with everybody who speaks. So, Madam Chair, I apologize. I don't know why we're having trouble hearing it, but when it goes off, I will I will state that the timer has gone off. Thank you. I want to. I just want to be respectful to everybody's time. Uh, next on my list is Mr. Michael Lofton. Are you with us, Mr. Lofton? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. State your name and address for the record, and you have two minutes. Very good. I'm Mike Lofton. I live at 508 Polling House Road in Harwood. Been here 50 years. I'm speaking tonight as a member of the Board of Growth Action Network. Uh, we submitted a letter to the council, which I hope you've had a chance to look at, particularly the map. It was the work of GAN that identified the 600 plus properties that uh, will become eligible to host these facilities under the requirements in the bill. Um, there's no doubt that agriculture is uh, in a multi-decade decline and we need a strategy to stabilize it. Unfortunately, we haven't developed a strategy, a strategy to do that. What 6920 does is asks you to authorize potentially significant new commercial uses on more than 600 uh, properties in the county. Uh, they've been advanced without meaningful public participation. I think some of the questions that are coming from the council are evidence that uh, there are a lot of unknowns here, a lot of details that haven't been examined. Meaningful public participation uh, is, 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 is absent. Tonight is the first time that the general public has a chance to comment on these bills. I would ask you, if you haven't already, to reread section 18-1-1016. That's the definition of agritourism. The proposed uses here are a, a quantum leap beyond anything that was anticipated in the local law uh, or in the state law. Uh, this, is, this is real different. Uh, matters of this consequence ought to receive thorough public examination. They should be rooted in a well thought out strategy and has, have established metrics and reporting mechanisms to evaluate impacts. None of that is here. Um, we're in the middle of updating our general development plan and we'll soon move into regional area plans. This is where they, these matters of great import regarding land use ought to be considered. It's here, it's now. Uh, there is no reason to uh, fast track this around a proper vetting process. I urge you to pause this, these bills and submit them to the GDP process. The end. Madam. 
thank you, Mr. Lofton. You timed your, your comments uh, perfectly. Uh, Ms. Kayla Griffith, are you with us? Ms. Griffin, Griffith? No. Uh, I'm, I'm here. I'm oh, here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear Apologies. you. Apologies. Thank, Thank you, Madam Chair. Kayla Griffith, 5535 Greenock Road, Lothian, Maryland, 20711. I'm a fifth generation farmer in Lothian. My family has been farming here for over 100 years. And in order for me to continue farming as a young farmer for hopefully the next 100 years, I would like to support agritourism in the form of Bill 6920. Farming is always changing. If my great grandfather was here today, he wouldn't recognize our farm. We have tons of new machinery, tons of new technology, and there are no tobacco fields in sight, which is what he built our farm on. We need to be able to support future generations like tobacco used to support our farm. So I'm really grateful that agritourism is currently included in legislation, but I really hope that we can work to support these weddings and farm stays. I get multiple requests for these events and I have to send these people to neighboring counties instead of my own farm and my own operation. Farm events are not commercial. They are an event that is held by a family farmer and it's for people who have families and friends that they would like to enjoy the open spaces that we have in Anne Arundel County. Last year, I had my wedding on my family farm. We had 200 people at our wedding and there were no noise complaints from neighbors and traffic was not a problem. The farm a quarter mile down the road from me also had a family wedding last year. I go to bed early, sleep with the lights on, with the windows open, and I had no disturbance issues. I also would like to say the county um, ag commission meetings are open to the public. This bill has been in the works and under discussion for two years. And also there are not 600 farmers in Anne Arundel County. So while there are 600 properties indicated, this is an unrealistic number. I do not believe that a significant number of farmers would actually undertake uh, these events. So I thank you so much for your time and hope you will support Bill 6920. Madam Chair. Oh no, I'm muted. I'm sorry. Okay, next on our list is Maria Nowakowski. Has she joined the meeting? No, Martin Nowakowski. We will move to Ms. Anna Cheney. Are you with us, Ms. Cheney? Yes, thank you very much. Anna Cheney, 5801 Brookswood Road, Lothian, Maryland, Honey's Harvest Farm. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Council Members. And I want to thank everyone who has studied the ins and outs and the topics of special events and farm stays through the committees established by the Agricultural Farming and Agritourism Commission here for the county. I think at least three committees have been studying this with the help of all the county agencies, and I think it's been well, well thought out. I do hear that there are some uh, areas that need some refinement, I believe, and I want to thank the members of the public for taking the time to asking the questions, providing some of their uh, questions, concerns, and for our councilwoman, uh, Jessica Hare, especially in this particular district um, that seems to have a lot of impact with this. Um, potential impact, um, be it positive or otherwise. Um, of course, I do believe this is 100% positive, and I think that all of this discussion provides for the refinement and the betterment of this legislation. So I would just ask that each of you work with each other and with Lori Rhodes and all the agencies of the county to, to find the, the balance, because I think we're just about there. Um, I think a few more tweaks will make it an even better bill that would um, basically fulfill the intention of this of this legislation and the intention really is to keep farms farming as you've heard so far from a couple of farmers hopefully there are a few more that might have a chance to express their needs I know that as a 13th generation and around the county resident and a long lineage of farmers I grew up on a farm I'm raising my family on a farm I have three children who are involved in our farming activities and I aspire to to make it a sustainable farm so that we're not needing you know, substantial subsidies from the government or anyone else 
and I would like to have them have a future in farming. I would like to see our farm stay in farming. And I do believe that when people connect with the land, I watch it. I do farm tours at our farm every Sunday morning. And to watch the children connect with the land, pick the raspberries, the passion fruit, the figs, the autumn berries, the autumn olive, all the things right off the vine and see that connection. Madam Chair, the timer has gone off. Thank you for your support. Thank you, Ms. Cheney. Um, Jessica Clar, oh, I'm not probably pronouncing that right. Yes, um, Clar. Oh, I did it right. Yes, thank you. How are you? Okay, uh, my name is Jessica Clar. Uh, my address is 8970 St. Andrews Drive in Chesapeake Beach, Maryland. And I'm speaking today to support Bill 6920, which is for expanding the use of the allowed on farms and agricultural heritage sites, allowing farms um, and heritage sites events of a temporary use. Uh, we're becoming further removed from life on the farm, and these types of opportunities will let people connect with the local farmland and the local food and the farmers who grow it, so they will actually have more value for the land and want to help us preserve it. Traditional farming has become more challenging to turn a profit, while development has become an easier and more lucrative option for our lifelong farmers. To support working farmers and allow them to continue to work the land and raise livestock, we need to be allowed to invite the public to visit these farms for experiences that promote farm products while inspiring a love of the land and appreciation of its beauty to all of its visitors. The people of South County work very hard to preserve the essence of Southern Anne Arundel County in this area, and these bills support that effect by preserving farms and farming in this county. Um, so thank you very much. I'd like to have you all support this bill 6920. Thank you. Thank you. Dane Wilfong, are you with us? Dane Wilfong, have you joined the meeting? Yes, yes I have. Can I be heard? You can. Please state your name and address for the record and you have two minutes. <clears throat> yes, uh, my name is Dane Wilfong and I reside 1103 Landington Avenue. Uh, although I am a Baltimore resident, I am greatly impacted by uh, this bill and uh, anything supporting or preventing the agricultural tourism in Anne Arundel and surrounding counties. Uh, I am a hospitality professional and I've been dealing with local farms and the like for a very, very long time. Uh, and I do believe it is extremely important to prevent damaging revenue possibilities for a collapsing industry further stressed by the current circumstances. Uh, farms previously mentioned are in more and more scarcity every day uh, for many obvious reasons and need to seek new avenues of revenue stream to continue to exist and provide the much needed revitalization um, of doing things the correct and honest way. Uh, as per sanitation regards and any other issues that others may have, uh, caterers are forced to meet these, whether at a festival or in a field. And I believe as long as everyone is meeting noise ordinance and proper regulations, a larger number should be allowed. And possibly a visit to understand, uh, or possibly a visit to your nearest farms uh, would provide you with an understanding of the good deeds that are being provided in your own very backyard. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Brielle Woods, have you joined the meeting? Yes, I have. Please uh, state your name and address for the record and you have two minutes. Good evening, my name is Brielle Woods and my address is 994 St. Margaret's Drive here in Annapolis. I support this bill and I also encourage you to support this bill as well to help our farmers so that they can continue to farm on their land. Large scale farming has become more and more challenging as development has consumed many of our larger plots of land, especially here in Anne Arundel County. When people visit and connect with farmland, the local and fresh food and ingredients that the farmers who are working hard to produce it, guests start to value that land and they want to then preserve it. That is the beauty of agritourism. Many Anne Arundel citizens work very hard to preserve the nature, the history, ecology, and agriculture of this county. This bill does exactly that. It preserves farms and farming in this county. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Long, have you joined the meeting? I reside at 8402 Bayside Road in Chesapeake Beach, Virginia, and I supported the bill 6920. I've been employed for over 15 years at a small, two small farm wineries in the Virginia area, and I am new to Maryland. I feel that this bill being passed allows employment opportunities to the community and it allows income to the farmers 
which gives them the opportunity to continue farming and passing their farm on to their future generations. Thank you. Next on my list is Andrew Post. Mr. Post, are you with us? Mr. Post? I will move down to Mr. Gerardo Mar Martinez. Mr. Martinez, have you joined the meeting? Mr. Martinez? I'll go down to number 13, Ms. Laura Zeck. Laura Zeck, have you joined the meeting? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Please state your name and address for the record and you have two minutes. Yes, my name is Laura Zeck. I uh, live at 107 Tolson Street, Annapolis, Maryland. I would like to testify in favor of Bill uh, 6920. Um, I believe this bill is important in order to promote agricultural tourism um, and support the local Maryland farming community um, to continue with sustainable farming practices. Um, with limited events and farm stays, um, this business will not only teach the local community about Maryland agriculture, it will help ensure that it thrives by supporting the farmers. Um, and as the existing noise ordinance is observed in these events, um, I believe this would be a non-issue. Thank you. Thank you. Monique Larson, have you joined the meeting? Monique Larson. Okay, moving down to number 15, Mr. Adam Cottrell. Mr. Cottrell, have you joined the meeting? Absolutely, how are you? Thank you. <laughs> Good, state your name and address for the record. You have two minutes. Yes, Adam Cottrell, 540 West Bay Front Road, Lothian, Maryland. Uh, owner, operator, first generation farm, Floating Lotus Farmstead. Uh, we produce organic vegetables, mixed vegetables, four and a half acres. We've got a CSA program where we service 100 families a week and added farmer's markets. Uh, we estimate conservatively that we serve maybe three or 400 families uh, directly uh, with a lot of talking involved. Uh, we meet these people and talk to them and learn and, and we just get inundated with people really wanting to come to the farm uh, ignorantly to just hang out at a farm stand. But I, I know that as soon as they had access to stay and to actually see fields and to engage on a romantic, intimate level, if you will, uh, you know, it just really brings the light uh, to the farm instead of the misconnection that is obvious in our, in our, in our society. Uh, but that being said, um, small businesses, you know, have a hard time with employment, but young farmers and farmers of any size, we just maybe don't even get applicants. And that is because of the old connotation of farming being, you know, impossible to handle the labor, but technology has changed that a bit. The community uh, support has changed that a bit of the viability and that and thus, but bringing people to the farm maybe gives that new connotation of beauty and ease and connection. And without having those people come to the farm, they just, they don't really get it by just the farmer's market or the online form for my CSA. Uh, so that being said, I think this is a great way to connect the community to the farm, to build an investment for not just the immediate money to this farm, but the long term of maybe your farms will actually have enough workers to provide the food for the people that live in it. Uh, secondly, um, yeah, never mind. I really hope that you can support this because I believe that you've put in place checks and balances. Anyway, thank you. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, next on my list is Aya Linquist. Ms. Linquist, are you with us? Hello, this is Aya Linquist. I am located at 1609 Chesapeake Lane in Edgewater, Maryland. And I would just like to give my support for this bill. And I really hope that you all are able to do this. As a young aspiring farmer, I would like to take part in this one day once I have that underway. But yeah, I really support this. Thank you. Thank you. Number 17 on my list is David Riley. Mr. Riley, have you joined the meeting? I am here. Can you hear me? 
We can, sir. Please state your name and address for the record. You have two minutes. Excellent. Name is David Riley, 1046 Diamond Drive, Churchton, Maryland. I own a home down here uh, and two small businesses. I've been down in South County for 23 years. Um, we kind of have a saying down here in this part of the county, and that's keep South County rural, which was the first thing I thought of when I started looking at this the, uh, particular piece of legislation. But uh, my wife and I took a, a, a road trip last Saturday. The weather was beautiful, and we went to Doden, the winery, and we went to Green Street, and we went to Homestead, and we went to Nightingale, and all the little farms that we know down here. Jack and Jill, farm that most of us know down here isn't um, – operating anymore and I, and I don't think it has anything to do with this but I can't help but think that if if we had this kind of thing a little small farm like that might be able to operate um, still because they were a great little small country farm with local people that, that we all knew um, but I think we're kind of getting caught up with you know weddings and big events and this kind of thing and I, and I really think that this might have a lot more to do with supporting farms <clears throat> just from the opportunity to bring kids and family and community members to uh, to the farms to visit, learn and touch and feel like what a real life farm in action is all about. I think it's an amazing way to promote um, the farms, healthy eating, local produce, um, all that sort of stuff. So I'm totally in support of this bill um, and I hope you guys will consider it. And I thank you for allowing me to offer my opinion and God love you. I know you all have, or most of you have kids and children and online learning and this is dinner time and I don't know how you do it. It's been a long time since I've done this. And for me, it's um, in the middle of craziness. So good, yep. thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, next on my list is Mr. Brian Riddle. Mr. Riddle, are you with us? I'm here, can you hear me? Yes, please state Thank you, Matt. Sir. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the council. My name is Brian Riddle and I reside at 2417 Fox Creek Lane in Davidsonville. I'm a farm owner an ag advocate here in Anne Arundel County, and I request the council support bill 6920. I've been a member of an extensive work study group that ultimately, ultimately concluded with unanimous support from this council passing legislation to allow ag tourism to occur within our county on farms with a soils uh, cooperators agreement and those who have ag assessment. I also chair the Anne Arundel County Soil Conservation District. I vice chair our Agriculture and Farming Commission, and I chair the uh, ag tourism upper limits committee. This bill was a product of over six years of considerations to address the concerns and advise our administration with recommended changes to the regulatory code as by uh, the public and other advocates of ag tourism. Personally, I'd like to extend my gratitude to the administration and their support of this bill and the extensive effort that it took to arrive at this place. I'd especially like to recognize Ms. Rhodes and Ms. Kenny and the team that has put many hours into the process to uh, bring this ag tourism opportunity to our county. I'd also like to stress and strongly dispute the assertion that Mr. Lofton just made that GAN was not participating in the process. They in fact had a member who was an active participant in our upper limits committee and a member of our board. Um, please understand that ag tourism is currently happening within our neighboring municipalities with enhanced opportunities that support the struggling economics of conventional farming. Our commission which is a body consisting of a broad range of stakeholders, including community advocates and organizations, as well as government officials that have been instrumental with their contributions to help us develop the recommendation that arrived ultimately, we, ultimately with unanimous support from our Ag Commission. The Commission committees continue to work on the concerns and the opportunities to improve viability of the economic benefits and impact related to Ag Tourism. This bill provides significant regulatory structure and mechanisms for accessory activities that are already lawful and permitted on farms with agriculture operations. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Riddle. Last on my list is Mr. Dale Clark. Mr. Clark, have you joined the meeting? Yes, can you hear me? Oh, you know, I said Mr. again, I'm so sorry. Ms. Oh, Clark. <laughs> Ms. Clark, uh, do please make sure you have all other devices off. Uh, your audio has a very bad echo. Is this better? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Hello, my name is Dale Perry Clark, and our farm is at 6027 Fisher Station Road, Lothian, Mar Lothian, Maryland. And we have owned this farm for about 100 years. I wish to voice my support to pass 
Bill 69020 to allow agro-tourism events on their family farms. The Perrys, as do all the farm families of South County, have a need to be able to continue to make a living on their family farms. As you may be able to imagine, during this year of coronavirus, we've had more family and friends asking if we would consider opening a farm so that they may enjoy our wide open spaces. spaces. With that said, we'd like nothing more to share our love of the land with anyone that has an interest in it. Please consider passing this bill to aid in the sustainability of our family farms. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Um, that was the last on my list, the public hearing on bill number 69-20. Madam is Chair, did you want to do one last circle back for the ones we missed to see if they are here? Well, I had thought of that, but they were the same folks that didn't come forward on the other bill, but I'm happy to go back. I, I think we should just give everybody one more shout out. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Maria Nowakowski, have you joined the meeting? Martin Nowakowski, have you joined the meeting? Okay, and then Mr. Um, Mr. Martinez, Gerardo Martinez. And then I think the last person was Monique Larson. Ms. Larson, have you joined the meeting? Okay. Now the public hearing on Bill 6920 is closed. Madam Secretary, please read the title of Bill number 69-20. Bill number 6920, an ordinance concerning zoning farm or agricultural heritage site stays and special events. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, I know there is uh, at least a one technical amendment. Madam Secretary, can you please read amendment number one? Yes, Madam Chair, I'll wait for it to come up on screen. Do we have amendment number one to be shared on the screen? I think we should give it a minute. Here it comes. Here we are. Amendment number one. This technical amendment restructures a new provision that will allow farm or agricultural heritage site special events as temporary uses in certain residential districts. Thank you. Is there a motion to adopt? So moved, Hair. Is there a second? Second, Bulky. Miss um, Hare, is this your amendment? You yes. have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jessica Hare, District 7. Uh, this is really a formatting uh, amendment more than anything else, and I'll thank Ms. Corby for actually making the recommendation to me. We, we had a conversation back and forth. The, the way it's currently written uh, under the temporary uses 
uh, 182.203b. Uh, that long paragraph, I think, makes it very difficult to understand kind of what's being required where. All this amendment does is takes the language in Part B right there under temporary uses and breaks it out so that it is more easily understood what's required uh, for these temporary uses. It doesn't actually change any of the requirements. It's just formatting. So with that, I ask that you all vote favorably on this technical amendment. Is there any discussion about amendment number one? Would, would the administration like to weigh in on amendment one? Mr. Barry? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Anything that helps uh, make legislation more easily consumable is uh, supported by us. So we have no objection to this amendment. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Madam Secretary, please call the roll on amendment number one. Ms. Rodman? <clears throat> Ms. Rodman? Aye. Ms. Hare? Aye. Ms. Lacey? Aye. Mr. Volke? Aye. Mr. Prusky? Aye. Ms. Fiedler? Aye. Ms. Pickard? Aye. Seven in the affirmative, none in the negative. Amendment number one is adopted. I believe we have uh, amendment number two. We'll have it shared on the screen. Madam Secretary, please read amendment number two. Amendment number two. This amendment allows a farm or agricultural heritage site special event as a temporary use in certain residential districts if additional standards to mitigate the effect of noise, hazards, or other offensive factors on nearby properties are met. Is there a motion to adopt? So moved, Hare. Is there a second? Second, Volke. Ms. Hare, this is also your amendment. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jessica Hare, District 7. Um, one of the conversations I've tried to talk to a variety of people, like I said, on, on both in support and with concerns on this bill. And one of the concerns I heard uh, in terms of this being a good neighbor is how are we mitigating the effects of noise, uh, light pollution, things like that. Um, and, and I noted that in the conditional uses uh, for the 9 to 15 annual events, number four requires that any outdoor assembly area shall be located and designed to shield surrounding residential properties from the effects of noise, hazards, or other offensive conditions. That seems like a very good neighborly thing to do. That language is missing from the temporary use. And I think that it, it there is broad discretion in terms of how you accomplish that. Um, but I think whether you're holding four events or 15 events, um, we should be making sure that we're not uh, you know, shining bright lights in your neighbor's uh, back window or, um, you know, really kind of locating uh, amplifiers right next to uh, their window, things like that. So this, this just takes the exact language that is in paragraph four under the conditional use, um, that first sentence there, or that first phrase there, and it inserts it into the temporary use as well. So that in all events, we are making sure that we're shielding our neighbors and being good neighbors, um, making sure that they are not adversely affected by this. Would the administration like to weigh in on this amendment? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I want to thank the sponsor for sharing the amendment as soon as she had it ready for us to review. Um, B1 already has the planning and zoning officer looking at whether nearby properties are adversely affected. Uh, so this amendment just puts in writing what we would already do. Therefore, we have no objection. Are there any um, questions? Oh, Ms. Lacey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sarah Lacey, District 1. Um, while obviously District 1 um, doesn't have a lot of the uh, agricultural parcels that would be hosting these events, I'll speak from my personal experience of living within uh, five miles of Meriwether Post Pavilion um, and over the course of eight years going from hearing the sounds of you know one concert a month to two to three to four then every weekend all the time um, and it's obviously a very different operation but um, 
clearly noise is not noise especially and noise and lighting are you know two things that we really have to be sure that we we do shield um, neighbors and surrounding properties from um, that's one of the reasons we left Columbia for goodness sake um, <laughs> so I wouldn't want to put any anybody in um, South County who lives near these these farms um, you know in the position of being regularly subjected to unabated noise um, like we were on the other hand I feel we heard very impressive testimony from many young farmers uh, who sound very energetic and are passionate about um, you know, creating new revenue streams to sustain their farms and they're looking forward into the future. Um, and one thing that really struck me about that was that they sounded like very responsible, good neighborly type people already, um, that they have every incentive to continue to be so, and that um, allowing them to expand the uh, agritourism um, activities and opportunities on their farms, you know, is is not only is it good public policy, but that there should be room in that policy for experimentation. So I believe um, you know, earlier Councilwoman Harry who had a lot of concerns about trying to just understand what was the difference between one to eight events or what happens when you get kicked into the next category of nine to 15. And it seems to me that the one to eight is that room to experiment and that I, I would be very willing to write this additional restriction into code if there were a problem, but I don't want to support an, you know, additional burden um, that may not be, I don't want to put that kind of a strict limit. And so unfortunately I, I won't support this amendment. Any other, oh, Ms. Hare. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just want to respond briefly. I, I do understand Councilwoman Lacey's position on this. I will just say, I, I think the administration has said that this is the type of thing they envision looking at anyways, but it's not quite as clear in the temporary use. And so I, I do want to make it clear for future administrations, um, you know, future planning and zoning departments that, that that is a consideration they really have to, to look at. So I, I think it's important that it be in there. I agree with you. I think the farmers have the best intentions and and i think that they have the incentive to do so and i think that they they want to do the right thing so i don't actually think that this will be a significant additional burden uh to them but i do think it's an important clarifying piece in that temporary use so with that i ask uh, for support any other questions or comments about amendment number two madam secretary please call the roll on amendment number two Ms. rodvian Hi. Ms. Hare. Hi. Ms. Hare. Hi. Ms. Lacey. Hey. Mr. Volke. Hi. Mr. Prusky. Hi. Ms. Fiedler. Hi. Ms. Pickard. Hi. Six in the affirmative, one in the negative. Amendment number two is adopted. I believe we have a third amendment. Uh, Madam Secretary, once it's shared, will you please uh, read amendment number three? Amendment number three. This amendment allows a farm or agricultural heritage site special event as a temporary use in certain residential districts if a certain maximum attendee capacity is met. May I have a motion to adopt? Point of order, Madam Chair. That amendment had uh, paragraph five uh, listed as the amendment, but I believe with the prior amendment that just passed, we had a new paragraph five, and I think this amendment needs to have the 25 person per acre be paragraph number six. Otherwise, it will overwrite the prior one. Am I misunderstanding? Let's uh, give this a moment to take a look at it. Um, Madam Secretary, I can explain. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, this would follow our rule where we cannot predict if an amendment will be adopted or not. And so the uh, the renumbering will be accounted for when it gets added to the bill. There will be, it will become a six. That would be an editorial six. Perfect, thank you very much. Uh, in that case, uh, motion to adopt. 
May I have a second? Second, Fiedler. Uh, this is also your amendment, Ms. Hare. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, Jessica Hare, uh, District 7. So the capacity limits, we talked a little bit about those today. There are no current capacity limits on the temporary uses. Theoretically, a five acre parcel or a 10 acre parcel could have a thousand people. I don't know how likely that is. It sounds like from the conversation, that's probably not a super likely um, possibility, at least not initially, but I do think it struck me as odd in the bill that there is a capacity limit of 200 people uh, if you have nine or more events and there's no limit whatsoever on the first eight. And it seems like we need a little bit of parity between those. And I, I think particularly while we're in this period of sort of experimentation, if we call it that, with how these events are going to go, I think a cap um, is appropriate and potentially necessary as we see how the first couple of years go out. I didn't want to put a cap of say 200 people because I think larger farms, you can accommodate more people without having as many noise concerns and things like that. So toyed around with different numbers. I ended up at 25 per acre. So if you get to that 10 acre minimum, which you see in other areas of the bill, you're at 250 people. And that seems like a very reasonable number. If you have a larger farm and um, you know the noise is really not an issue, this number grows obviously and, and shouldn't be a, a barrier to any of the special events that you might wanna hold. Um, so with that, I, I think this is a good compromise between those people who are concerned about the over commercialization of some of these farms, but also still protecting that additional revenue stream for farmers um, who, who might need it. So with that, I ask for support. Are there any other questions or comments about amendment number three? Um, this is Allison Pickard, Chair District 2. I actually have a question. So with a five acre farm, that would limit in the temporary category to 125 people. Um, I'm just curious how you arrived at that number and if that's too restrictive and if we shouldn't wait to restrict until we find there's a problem. I, I don't know much about any of this industry, so I'm just asking. <laughs> Ms. Hare. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Jessica Hare, District 7. It, it was a little bit of a back and forth. Um, like I said, I went to the 10 acres that were in other parts of the bill and I looked at the fact that the conditional and special exception uses are 200 person. And so I tried to, to figure out at that 10 acre level where that would be. And honestly, 20 people per acre seemed a little bit low to me. So I went a little bit above that so that there's you know, for those people who want to hold only seven or eight events, um, they can have a little bit of an extra number of people. It's almost a disincentive, I suppose, to to have more events because the fewer you have, the more people you can have. Um, there's no magic math that got me to 25 other than that 210 acres seemed a little light at 20. And so I bumped it up a little bit. Great. Are there any other questions or comments about amendment number three? Madam Chair, if we could hold amendment number three for one moment, I believe there might have been something that did need to get fixed. If we could just uh, give Ms. Corby a moment to confirm. Sure. Ms. Hare, is that all right with you? Yes. <laughs> Madam Chair? Yes, ma'am. Um, a break is being requested. We are approximately 20 minutes away from our 10 minute recess. Shall we recess one moment? Um, shall we go ahead and um, Re recess while we uh, get this fixed. 
That sounds like a plan. May I have a motion to recess for 10 minutes? Councilman Peruski, so moved. We have a second. Mayor, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, motion carries. The council uh, sits in recess. We will be back at, how about we say, nine o'clock? Nine o'clock.
<clears throat> Madam Secretary, are you with us? Yes, Madam Chair, I am having a little video issue, but my audio should be working fine. Um, Madam Secretary, will you call the roll? Ms. Rodvian? Ms. Rodvian? Sorry, I'm always pressing the wrong button. I'm here. Ms. Hare? Present. Ms. Lacey? Present. Mr. Volke? Mr. Prusky? Still here. Ms. Fiedler? Present. Ms. Pickard? Here. Madam Chair, all council are present. Thank you. Did we find a resolution to amendment number three during the recess? Yes, we did. Um, Ms. Hare, would you like to take it or would you like me to? Uh, sure, I think I am with well, I have to withdraw my motion to adopt Amendment 3. Correct. I'm sorry, so there's a motion to adopt Amendment 3? There's a motion to withdraw Amendment number 3. So we need a second? Yes, Ms. Ms. Hare made a motion to adopt and it was seconded. So she is um, re taking back her motion to adopt and the second has to agree. And that has happened. I'm the second. Yes, so you agree. I agree. Okay, okay. I, I, I missed that step. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, so now Ms. Hare is officially withdrawing Amendment 3. Correct, and then we have an Amendment 4 instead that corrects the numbering issue that, that I brought up earlier. Okay, cool. Madam Secretary, uh, once it is shared, Will you read amendment number four? Amendment number four. This amendment allows a farmer agricultural heritage site special event as a temporary use in certain residential districts if a certain maximum attendee capacity is met. Is there a motion to adopt amendment number four? Hair, so moved. Is there a second? Needler, second. Ms. Hare, this is your amendment. I guess we've already been talking about it, but I'll let you continue the conversation. Jessica Hare, District 7. I'll just say everything I said before, uh, this amendment just corrects the numbering and includes the language from the prior amendment that passed already. So it, it it's all up to date now. Uh, is there any... Um, further comment or questions about amendment number four. Okay, I, I would just like to chime in, Allison Picker, District 2. I, I'm still a little concerned that this is too restrictive and having planned a wedding just shy of 17 years ago, I do know that events, um, whether they're for 50 or 250, require the same amount of setup and investment. And I, I think I would prefer if we proceeded with this bill in a way that solved a problem rather than assumed that there was a problem. Um, so I will be voting against this amendment, um, but I do appreciate um, the intent and the hard work that's been put on this bill and these amendments. Um, any other comments or questions? Madam Secretary, please call the roll on amendment number four. Ms. Rodvian. Aye. Ms. Hare. Aye. Ms. Lacey. Aye. Mr. Volke. Aye. Uh, Mr. Volke, I believe I heard you say aye. That's correct, aye. Mr. Prusky. Aye. Ms. Fiedler. Aye. Ms. Pickard. Nay. Five in the affirmative two in the negative, amendment number four is adopted. Okay, great. Uh, bill number 69-20 as amended will be heard on October 19th, 2020. Madam Secretary, please read the title of bill number 70-20. Bill number 70-20, an ordinance concerning pensions, employees retirement plan, Fire Service Retirement Plan, Police Service Retirement Plan, Detention Officers and Deputy Sheriff's Retirement Plan, Disability Pensions. 
Thank you. This is an amend. This is an administration <laughs> administration bill. Uh, Mr. Pruski and I are also co-sponsors. Mr. Barron, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Pete Barron with the administration. Uh, I have a, a very distinguished panel of folks who have hung around for a while. Uh, so joining me from personnel is Ms. Dickerson and Ms. Badowski. Uh, from budget, Mr. Taru. From police, Major Passman. Uh, our fire chief, Chief Wolford. Uh, from detention, Acting Superintendent Borgesi. Uh, from the Sheriff's Office, Ch uh, Chief Deputy. Tui, um, and from law, last but not least, Ms. Lori Blair Klausmeyer. I think I got everybody at the virtual table. If I didn't, I apologize. Um, Bill 70-20 will ensure that when a public safety employee is disabled, the county lives up to our responsibility to care for them. Each of the county's four pension plans provide pension benefits for an employee who is or becomes totally and permanently disabled and meets certain criteria. All of the plans uh, offer a service-connected and a non-service-connected disability benefit. To be eligible for a disability pension, all of the plans require that the disability prevent the participant from performing their regular duties. In the employee's plan, the participant also must be and remain unable to be employed by the county in some other position for which the participant is suited by or for which is appropriate to the participant's training and experience. In the fire, police, and detention officers and deputy sheriff's plan, the disability also must prevent the participant from performing any other assignment within their respective department. This bill codifies the practice that if, for example, a firefighter is disabled and can no longer be a firefighter because of that dis disability, they would not have to take a non-sworn job in the fire department, that they would be eligible for a disability pension. Uh, the same goes for police, sheriff, or detention. Uh, this is uh, the result of extensive discussions with the employee representatives, personnel, law, and the administration, uh, as well as a number of you. Um, so I want to thank everybody that has, has patiently waited through a very complicated issue. Um, one last thing, uh, a, a, pro a provision is added that a, a participant would be disqualified uh, from the service-related disability pension if the participant becomes employed in a position with the same requirements as the participant's regular assignment uh, during the first five years of receiving the pension. Uh, to go back to the firefighter example, uh, that individual gets a job as a firefighter in another jurisdiction. Um, the, the distinguished panel here um, and, and I are, are happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, the administration asks uh, for a favorable report on this bill tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pruski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I am a co-sponsor on this bill and uh, I've been lucky to serve in this county in many different capacities. And I, I will tell you, uh, this has actually been going on for quite a long time. Um, when I served on the Board of Appeals many years ago, and of course those cases are all solved now, there were several instances where the right thing that shouldn't be done was not done to some of our officers in public service. And it, it made me sick. And certainly uh, as the administration knows, I've been trying to advocate for this for quite a long time and we had an ear in the folks of trying to do this. And, and I think what people need to understand is that uh, trying to do the right thing uh, for folks who work hard but get injured, particularly in a job that is prone to injury. Uh, let's face it, uh, in terms of uh, what our folks do on a daily basis of public safety. So again, I want to thank the administration for supporting this. I've been a long advocate for it. Again, I think it, it's, it's the right thing to do. It's long overdue, and I appreciate and ask my colleagues to, to support this effort. Um, for folks, again, who didn't get this opportunity, but as we move forward, we can correct 
uh, something that, that should have been. So thank you again. Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Barron. Uh, just real quick, I, I do want to mention, and I, I left it out of my remarks, the Pension Oversight Committee, as required by code, sent a letter in support of the legislation. Thank you. And, and um, to echo my, my colleague's sentiments, um, in, in this is Allison Pickard, Chair of District 2, I want to thank everybody that's worked hard and, and my colleagues who have had a hand in, in making this bill a reality tonight along with um, some lengthy conversations with our public safety leadership. Um, to me, this is common sense and this is fair. And this is what our public safety uh, sworn officers deserve um, and we should uphold that responsibility. With that, Mr. Volke, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Nathan Volke, District 3. Um, I'm not sure who on the panel is best to answer this question, but my first question is about the five-year disqualification period. How did you arrive at the five-year period um, after an individual begins receiving uh, benefits under the disability uh, if they obtain employment somewhere else that that's when they're disqualified? Why five? Why not some other number? Uh, Mr. Barron. Uh, Pete Barron with the administration. I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Blair Klausmeyer uh, to weigh in if there was a, a, any technical reason. I believe we thought it was a fair number. Uh, it does, it shouldn't be, we shouldn't be chasing people forever and ever and all time. Um, so five years is more than enough time we felt um, for the types of, of, of injuries that uh, qualify. So Ms. Blair Klausmeyer, was there any reason, any science behind, or, or Ms. Dickerson, uh, any reason exactly why we landed on five? Um, this is Lori Blair Klasmeyer, uh, Deputy County Attorney. The five years was already in the code. So we did not change those time periods at all. And that's way before my time, so I can't tell you why they picked five. <laughs> uh, thank you. So uh, just to follow up, um, I believe when a, um, it would, a public safety employee, if they were to become disabled in Anne Arundel County and then go seek employment somewhere else, they would have to go through a verification process of that, of that previous training and previous employment anyway. So this is the five year thing that's going to get caught up somewhere in the, in their employment, um, unless they're going all the way back through a training school in, in, you know, Utah. Is that an accurate statement of how employment works in this field? Anyone? Terry oh, Dickerson, personnel officer. So generally speaking, especially in public safety, there's usually a physical that has to be um, taken in order to move into those types of roles. And so if there is some uh, disability, it would probably be identified at that point. Um, the other piece of that is that when there are background checks done on prior employment, it would have been identified during that time as well. Thank you, Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Nathan Volke, District 3 again. This is probably a question for the auditor, but anyone on the panel can also answer. So um, in the auditor's blue note or blue letter, it refers to the cost of this uh, change to the code and suggests that it's going to be, I believe, an annual cost of a little over $428,000 uh, that'll increase at 3% a year in future fiscal years based on payroll growth. Um, so I just want to make sure that I understand that is an annual cost of 428 for this bill. Ms. Smith. You're muted. Not of. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so the actuary did a study and this study was for the fire service, retirement, police service and, and detention. So it did not include the employer's plan. So the 428-300 um, is the combination of a normal cost and amortization payment, um, both which, um, and I should clarify for the record, um, the actuary wanted to make sure I clarified that both costs are expected to go up about 3% per year based on payroll salary costs. The normal cost will 
be continual every year. The amortization cost will be either seven or 10 years. So seven years um, is for the um, detention and deputy sheriff's plan and 10 years for the fire service and public um, uh, police um, service retirement plans. Um, they expect less of a fiscal impact for the employee's retirement plan because proportionately there are less service connected, um, there are less um, disabilities um, as opposed to public safety, but I do, don't have a cost because they actually didn't do a study on that. Um, let's see if there's anything else I need to share. Um, but yes, the 428 in response to your question, that is the annual cost that the actuary determined contribution that they put in every year, he would um, estimate going up um, for those three plans. Okay, thank you, Ms. Smith. Nathan Volke, District 3 again. So the cost is expected. I just want to, you said a lot there, and I just want to yeah, make sure sure. I understand it in sort of as plain language as possible. Sure. The cost to our county operating budget and what the county will need to be contributing um, to ensure that this is a funded liability uh, is $428,000 per year. And that's likely to go up. But right now, that's what we're looking at that number being. Is that, am I getting all that correctly? Yes. So it'll be based on salary. So obviously, as the salaries increase, it will also increase. Um, and, and he's estimated it'll go up 3% based on normal pal salary increases. But yes, that would be the annual cost. Sure. Okay, thank you. And then if I may, Madam Chair. Go ahead. Nathan Volke, thank you. Nathan Volke, District 3. Um, I, I'm not sure if anybody from the budget office is here. Maybe Mr. Thoreau is here and could answer the question, but how does this uh, impact sort of the budget? I'm assuming this was not budgeted for yet in this year's budget. Is that right? And if it was not, how do we expect to pay for it? Or was it budgeted and... and I just didn't see that noted in the blue letter, so that's why I'm asking. Oh, maybe Ms. Smith. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so generally, they start doing an actuary recommended um, contribution around January for next year's budget. So since it's being adopted, it will be considered when they come up with how much to contribute into the fiscal year 22 budget. Okay. Mr. Turow, did you want to add anything to that? I would, uh, Stephen through from the budget office, uh, I'm happy to answer. So yeah, uh, as Ms. Smith has stated, we base our contribution to the pension fund on an actuarial analysis. So that will get trued up with these legislative changes the following year. So there's no budget impact for this year because we've already contributed, contributed what we need to contribute to the pension fund for the current fiscal year. Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Nathan Volke, District 3. Uh, I appreciate that response. So just so that I'm clear, next year when we go into the budget, whatever amount we have, and obviously that's up in the air, particularly with the economy right now, this is a certainty that we will need to be funding this in the next budget, as you're talking about with the true up. So when we look at if our previous year actuarial recommended amount was X, it's going to be X plus $428,000 for next fiscal year's budget. Am I understanding that correctly? So Stephen through from the budget office again, if all else was equal, that would be correct, Mr. Volke. But I would like to just kind of reiterate that the pension actuary is based on a tremendous amount of assumptions, such as our return on our investment. So if our return on investment is off by, you know, half a percentage, that's gonna have a much larger fiscal impact than just this uh, change right here. And we're talking about $2 billion worth of roughly our assets and our pension fund, that that amount is going to change based on our assumptions much more than this change would be. But yes, all else equal, $428,000. Okay, thanks very much. And, and so Nathan Volke, District 3, just final follow-up question on this. Um, is this something that the budget office at this point in time is, is recommending um, is sort of an affordable um, thing for us to pass? Is this, is this something that looks like we should be able to afford this next year based on the projections that you're seeing? Because I know you all 
throughout the year, keep updating your projections as to income and what the county's going to receive, revenues, et cetera, uh, based on market conditions and economics. So I'm just trying to get a flavor of where you all are, are viewing us sitting for FY22. Pete Barron with the administration. I'll, I'll let Mr. Taru answer from the budget perspective, but I, I do want to just sort of point out, we are talking about people who are uh, serving the county in a public safety role. So whether we can, I mean, I believe we can, and, and I'm, I'm sure Mr. Taru will answer, but um, we have a commitment here that we need to keep. And and some things are, are, are also important that might not be dollars and cents. I'm sorry, Mr. Drew, but that's true. <laughs> uh, Steven Drew from the Budget Office, just to follow up with that, uh, Councilman Volpe. Uh, this would be kind of labeled as, I would say, non-discretionary spending when we look at the budget for next year. So this would be folded into our non-discretionary spending uh, for next year's budget. Again, uh, this would be based on a lot of assumptions that the pension board will have to kind of weigh out. Um, and that would be folded into those costs as our normal kind of cost of doing business for next year. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, and Nathan Bulky, District 3. Mr. Barron, I, I appreciate the point you're making. I agree with you. Um, I think this is just probably going to impact you getting those other inspectors that we talked about on the other bill. Do we have any other questions or comments regarding Bill 70-20 at this time? Seeing none, we will now open the public hearing on bill number 70-20. Madam Secretary, do we have any testimony received from members of the public? Uh, we haven't had any submissions of online written testimony. Thank you. And we did not, while we did not have any members of the public sign up to speak, I would like to note that each of us received upwards of 50 emails uh, regarding this bill uh, in support. Um, the public hearing on bill number 70-20 is now closed. Madam Secretary, please read the title of bill number 70-20. Bill number 7020, an ordinance concerning pensions, employees retirement plan, fire service retirement plan, police service retirement plan, detention officers and deputy sheriff's retirement plan, disability pensions. Is there any further discussion at this time? Seeing none, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on bill number 70-20. Ms. Rodvian? Aye. Ms. Hare? Aye. Ms. Lacey? Aye. Mr. Volke? Aye. Mr. Prusky? Aye. Ms. Fiedler? Aye. Ms. Pickard? Aye. Seven in the affirmative, none in the negative. Bill number 70-20 is passed. Madam Secretary, please read the title of bill number 71-20. Bill number 71-20, an ordinance concerning personnel, employee relations, limitations on joining employee organizations. This is an administration bill. Mr. Barron, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Pete Barron with the administration joining me at the virtual table is Ms. Dickerson and Ms. Harold from personnel. Um, from police, Major Passman is sticking around and uh, Ms. Blair Klausmeyer will also uh, stick around for Bill 7120. Um, employee representatives of the FOP and the Supervisors Association have expressed the desire to merge. Uh, the leadership of those organizations reached out to the administration, which is why 7120 is before you now. This bill changes county code to add police sergeants to the list of job classifications who are allowed to be in the employee organization that also represents their subordinates. To be clear, this bill does not mandate that sergeants join a particular organization that decision would be subject to an election by the members of that job classification. This bill simply gives them the freedom to choose. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions as are the folks at the panel, um, but this is, this is a good bill that will help increase efficiency um, and, and give uh, 
what um, the employees who have expressed this desire, the ability to uh, join the employee organization of their um, choosing. Thank you. And uh, uh, I forgot to mention that both Mr. Pruski, Ms. Rodvian, and myself are co-sponsors of this bill. Are there any questions of the administration at this time? Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Nathan Volke, District 3. Um, this question is actually for Ms. Blair Klassmeyer. Uh, I, I just wanted to clarify something. I, I, as the chair just noted, we did get a lot of email testimony from FOP members in particular in support of Bill 70, 71, and 74. Uh, but one of the statements that had been made repeatedly about Bill 71-20 was the idea that it had to be passed tonight or else it was going to um, significantly impact their bargaining and they would be unable to petition again, I think, uh, for certification to join the FOP, the sergeants and the lieutenants, for another two years. You and I had gone back and forth about that on email, and I just want to clarify so that everybody is on board. Um, that is not actually the case. In fact, there is nothing that requires that this bill would have had to have been passed tonight um, for this change to take effect. Is that correct? Larry Blair, class, my deputy county attorney. That is correct. The petitions have to be filed in October. That's what the code requires. Um, the personnel officer has indicated that those petition, I'm sorry, the yeah, the petition to certify or decertify has to be filed in October. They will be accepted um, in October. There's then a process that occurs that includes an employee um, election. And the reason that I go, go on to that is that the two year ban is if you have an election and the employees vote against it, then you can't come back and try to either certify or decertify again for two years. So um, the, the window, there would be a window next year if for some reason the process didn't go forward this year, but the petitions will be accepted in October and there's no legal requirement that that whole process um, be completed in October. So once this um, bill is effective, the elections can occur and this can all move forward in 2020 so perfect thank you very much i appreciate you clarifying that are there any questions or comments regarding um 71-20 seeing none we will now open the public hearing on bill number 71-20 madam secretary do we have any testimony received from members of the public no madam chair we haven't had any uh, submissions of online written testimony for Bill 7120. Thank you. And we do not have any members of the public signed up to speak. The public hearing on Bill number 71-20 is now closed. Madam Secretary, please read the title of Bill number 71-20. Bill number 7120, an ordinance concerning personnel, employee relations, limitations on joining employee organizations. Is there any further discussion at this time? Seeing none, uh, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on bill number 71-20. Ms. Rodvian? Aye. Ms. Hare? Aye. Ms. Lacey? Aye. Mr. Volke? Aye. Mr. Pruski? Aye. Ms. Fiedler? Aye. Ms. Pickard? Aye. Seven in the affirmative, none in the negative. Bill number 7120 is passed. Madam Secretary, please read the title of bill number 7220. Bill number 7220, an ordinance concerning licenses and registrations, unattended donation boxes. Mr. Volke is the sponsor of this bill. Mr. Volke, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll try to be brief um, in, in the pantheon of weighty issues that we've dealt with tonight. This is probably not the most important to everyone, uh, but I do, it, I do think that it impacts a, a lot of people in the county because if you have driven anywhere in this county, you have probably seen unattended donation collection boxes. Uh, they are extremely well-intentioned. The idea is that you are able to donate things to individuals who are in need and these boxes are a way that you can drop things there and then that can get to the people who need those resources. Uh, the challenge is when these boxes begin to overflow, uh, when they are not collected, um, 
or when you start to see situations where things that are not appropriate are left around the donation boxes. Um, for instance, if you have people who want to donate food because, again, they're thinking that it's going to help someone, but instead it winds up attracting animals. Um, or some people abuse these and decide they're going to use them as a de facto dumping place. Um, unfortunately, as with all good things, sometimes there are a, a percentage of people who abuse or misuse them. And so the intention with this bill is to try to figure out where these boxes are in the county and allow them to continue, but also get some information about the folks putting out the boxes so that we at least know if your box has a problem, if for instance, this collection box is sitting there not being cleaned up or uh, taken care of, we know who to call and we can ask you to come out and clean this situation up. Uh, if you refuse to do it, then we may even have a way to uh, start to impose some penalties on you for your failure to abide by the county code. Uh, so that is the purpose with this donation boxes legislation. I have to thank Ms. Shewitt who uh, went far and wide across the country looking through legislation to find some model codes on this particular, um, this particular issue. And I think that she did a nice job of coming up with a concise but thorough version of the bill. Uh, our neighbors in Baltimore County, I think, have something like a 27 page bill about unattended donation collection boxes. I'm not making you all we, um, wade through that. This is uh, only about three pages. So I think we've gotten the main things that we need here. I also wanna thank the administration because there are a number of amendments to this bill. Uh, we had a chance after it was introduced to sit down and have a very detailed conversation about this bill. And ultimately, I believe that if these amendments pass, uh, we should be in a place where I'm hopeful the administration can support the bill as drafted. Uh, but I recognize that they had some significant concerns about this bill prior to the amendment, uh, which we'll be proposing this evening at the appropriate time. So with that, I welcome the conversation and discussion. I look forward to the amendments and I thank everybody uh, for all their help in this. Would the administration like to weigh in on this bill, Mr. Barron? Thank you, Madam Chair, Pete Barron with the administration. Joining me at the virtual table from INP is our director, Mr. Africa, from law, Ms. Kenny. Um, I, I wanna uh, first say uh, we, the administration appreciates the sponsor working with us on amendments to address the concerns that we raised at the work session and prior to the bill's introduction. Uh, we'll, we'll comment on the amendments at the appropriate time. Um, the, the administration agrees with the sponsor uh, wholeheartedly that these boxes when not regulated create a serious blight problem. Um, we believe the amendments that will be offered will balance the needs uh, to provide opportunities for charitable donation, which is uh, critically important. Um, with the numerous um, uh, for-profit or, or less than um, noble actors uh, as well as the burden uh, placed on county resources to, to do the um, enforcement and um, registration. Uh, I, in addition to thanking Ms. Shewitt, I, I wanna make sure that we uh, recognize Ms. Kenny um, for her, her work, especially in, in uh, working this through. It was, I think, um, one of the more productive meetings I was in last week. So. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Shewitt, Ms. Kenny, uh, Mr. Africa, and, and the sponsor. Uh, I'll, we'll comment on the amendments at the appropriate time. But without the amendments, the administration is not prepared to support the bill. But spoiler alert, if we get the amendments, we'll be okay. Mr. Pruski. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you to my esteemed colleague in District 6, obviously, uh, for introducing this. I guess here's my question. Uh, you know, sometimes we're looking for a, uh, a solution that creates another problem for people for the donation piece. So, so I guess here's my question. Um, I've never had a donation box dropped in public property. They're always on private property. And I actually, uh, do for this bill, dropped by where I saw donation boxes. There's one at a Catholic school. There's one at an auto shop. And each of the owners that I spoke with, it, they know it's there. They've approved it. And anytime they have a problem, they call the donation box owner to solve it. So again, I don't know what the amendments are stating, uh, but maybe there could be a number 
place on uh, the container that if it's overflowing or whatever else. But again, my understanding is that these are put on private property, um, mostly. And I don't know if there's an issue in other districts. Again, I'm just speaking to, to my piece uh, from that end. And so I ju just want to make clear, again, um, and I understand the registration piece, what you're doing in the bill, but uh, how far do we go? And then what is the impact of these folks who actually utilize this? So uh, I don't know if you've ever seen, it's uh, Maryland Militia or Minutemen, I forgot that's one group, Paper Retrievers, another one, Schools Collect Paper. Uh, there's another group, uh, Purple Heart, which uh, do collect for military veterans, other things. And I think there was one more that I saw um, that was a Goodwill bin uh, down in Crofton uh, when I drove through. So I, I guess, I don't know if the sponsor or anyone else reached out to those organizations to see also their feedback. Um, I do understand, and I've seen it where it's overflowed, but I've also seen the property owner follow up to address the issue. And the last thing we want to do is a limited donation. So I, again, I'm just trying to figure out where we're at, but what the admin and the sponsor, what uh, due diligence or whatever else. I, I know there's some work put into this, but it would be helpful. Thank you. Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and thank you to my colleague in District 4, um, Nathan Volke, District 3. So I understand the question, Mr. Pruski, and I appreciate it. Um, I think the issue that I ran into in my district in particular was we had a situation where one of these boxes was placed actually on a post office site in Pasadena. Uh, it was directly on Mountain Road and it was visible, very visible from Mountain Road. So we, we did exactly what you suggested, uh, we being myself and my legislative assistant. Uh, we reached out to the post office and said, did you know this box was there? They weren't really aware the box was there. We looked on the box to try to see, was there a way we could call somebody? There was no contact number for it. Um, ultimately, we had to go and work through with the post office. It took a number of months and that box was finally relocated away from that property. Uh, but that was a specific instance that we had where the property owner really didn't approve of that box being placed there. And there was no easily accessible way to reach someone to say, hey, you put this donation box here, please make sure that you're not you know, cluttering up the neighborhood. Um, and there were, there were a, a number of times where I was getting constituents reaching out to me to say, these boxes are overflowing, there's stuff everywhere, what can we do? And we were really in a, a tough position where we did not have much in the way of either A, enforcement, or B, ability to reach out and just ask, sort of request that the, the owner come in and, and do something about it. Um, so that's the concern that we had, and that's what really was the impetus for pushing this bill forward. This is Allison Pickard, Chair D2. And in a similar vein, I had some questions um, since we've been talking tonight about the staffing levels of inspections and permits. Um, I, I'm, and I'll wait for the amendments, but do we, as these are placed on, on private property, have we, does this bill shift the, the onus to the county inspections and permit, permit staff um, and zoning enforcement away from the private property owner. I have a private property owner that will remain nameless uh, who has a box that they is in not in great shape, but they also don't maintain their own property very well. And I'm just curious if we're putting shifting the burden to the county away from our private property owners. So we'll wait, maybe the, the those questions will be asked in the amendments. Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate that. And, and if I can, I don't want to speak for Mr. Africa or Mr. Barron, and I don't want to get ahead of the discussion, but I also am hopeful that maybe when we get there, we can move these amendments swiftly. So I'm going to try to answer your question now. Uh, we did discuss this pretty extensively. This was a concern that the administration certainly raised. They were very worried about this too. Uh, and part of what we discussed was how much of this is complaint driven versus how much of this is enforcement driven where the county is going out and proactively inspecting these boxes. Um, I don't wanna speak for Mr. Africa, but I believe the intent from, well, I can tell you the intent from my side and I believe the administration's intent after we discussed is that this will largely be a complaint driven process as opposed to an inspection um, or some sort of enforcement process that the county has a responsibility uh, to go out and check these. Thank you. Um, so one of the things that we get engaged in in District 2 is dumpsters. And I know 
uh, that are on private property. So I know when a private dumpster is in violation and you have to go through the abatement process, I'm probably not even using these words right, it gets into a long protracted legal battle. Um, so we'll, I'm gonna hold all my questions and comments uh, for the amendments and hoping all my, all my concerns are, are dealt with there. Ms. Lacey. Thank you, Madam Chair, Sarah Lacey, District 1. Um, I am having trouble deciding whether I can really agree even with the premise of the bill. I, because I think property owners, private, you know, private property owners can always just, if someone drops a box, um, one of these collection boxes on their property without their permission, then the private property owner always has the right to remove the box. Um, and it would seem like one of the things they could do even is literally put it out with their regular trash collection and Anne Arundel County will pick it up just like we would a refrigerator or other appliance. So, you know, another way to very low cost way to solve the problem of a nuisance box would be to literally put it out with the trash and then basically say perhaps um, at our landfill lots, we could impound the boxes and folks who've dropped their boxes without permission on private property could come find them at the landfill, you know, and pay the cost to pick them up and do whatever else they want to do with them. Um, which, you know, may seem like a, a, a lot, but my legislative assistant has over the years had to deal with unattended uh, donation boxes and trying to identify where they've come from and try to chase down uh, the owners of those boxes. And it just seems to me that this kind of nuisance doesn't exist if the box isn't there. And so I, I'm just finding it really hard, even looking ahead to the amendments that are expected to be offered to understand why we would go to all this effort to legislate a remedy of this nuisance problem rather than putting the burden and keeping the burden where it already is, but uh, you know, putting that on the private property owner to take care of. Um, I mean, the post office is maybe a little bit of a different, except, you know, a different case because they're federal. But, you know, beyond that, I think we're legislating a solution where, you know, we, we don't need to step in. We need to just enforce the nuisance property laws that we already have. If there's no further questions, uh, we will now open the public hearing on bill number 72 -2. Madam Chair, I believe Ms. Shewitt has her flag up. And again, I remind everyone, if you are not getting noticed, you can verbally ask for recognition. Madam Chair, may I be recognized, please? You may, Ms. Shewitt, my apologies. There's too not many boxes on the screen. Not a problem. I just wanted to add a few thoughts. Um, one, is, one thought is that there is at least one example in the county of a collection uh, donation bin being put on what is basically abandoned property. There is nobody there, nobody pays attention to it, and that was a box that was presenting problems. That's one notion. I also have two donation boxes right down the street from me. They are practically on top of each other, and I would like to bet that they are in the right of way. So one important part of this bill, it really the intention is to not have IMP do a whole lot of work on this. If the owner of the box um, submits an application to be registered, they really just look at whether it's completed. But an important part of it is that they, they also decide the location of the box so that to make sure that it's in an appropriate spot so as to not be in the, in the right of way of the county or to otherwise impede um, exiting a property or entering a property and things like that. But um, so those are two reasons that um, we thought merited attention. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I think scan my, my screen here. Uh, we will now open the public hearing on Bill 72-20. Madam Secretary, do we have any testimony received from members of the public? You're muted. No, Madam Chair, no submissions of uh, online written testimony. Thank you. We do not have any members of the public signed up to speak. The public hearing on bill number 72-20 is now closed. 
Um, Madam Secretary, please read the title of bill number 72-20. Bill number 7220, an ordinance concerning licenses and registrations, unattended donation boxes. So I have, uh, oh, Mr. Volke. <coughs> Sorry, Madam Chair, Nathan Volke, District 3. I was just gonna, um, as I think you know, there are amendments one through eight on this bill. I just figured for ease, I could go over them all, but I was gonna make a motion that we block vote on all eight amendments at once. Um, just because I think they're either going to rise or fall together. So I just figured in the effort of saving some time, we, we could do that. Okay. So Madam Chair, that would mean, um, Mr. Volke makes a motion to take amendments one through eight as a block. The motion needs to be seconded and voted on. And then I would read them all in. Okay. Is, there's a motion. Is there a second? Chair, second. Uh, so we're going to vote on the motion to vote here and vote on amendments one through eight as a block. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Ms. Rodvian? Aye. Ms. Hare? Aye. Ms. Lacey? Aye. Mr. Volke? Aye. Mr. Prusky? Aye. Ms. Fiedler? Aye. Ms. Pickard. Aye. Uh, seven in the affirmative, none in the negative. The motion to vote on amendments one through eight as a block is passed. So Madam Secretary, you'll please read in amendments one through eight. Yes, Madam Chair. Amendment number one. This amendment requires a nonprofit operator of an unattended donation box to provide proof of its 501c3 status. Amendment number two. This amendment adds a requirement for a fee to register an unattended donation box, but exempts 501c3 nonprofit operators. Amendment number three. This amendment requires that contact information for an operator of an unattended donation box include a telephone number with recording capability. Amendment number four. This amendment clarifies that the vicinity map must show the location of the unattended donation box on the property. Amendment number five. This amendment clarifies that the department must approve the location of an unattended donation box. Amendment number six. This amendment clarifies that the department may not accept the renewal of a registration if there are open citations, unpaid fines, or unresolved violations or complaints relating to the unattended donation box. Amendment number seven, this amendment prohibits blight on or around an unattended donation box. And amendment number eight, this amendment requires the operator of an unattended donation box to remove material in or around an unattended donation box. Mr. Prusky. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, again, I'm not an attorney, but I play one on TV. Uh, Ms. Schuett, can you tell me the difference between an unintended and an attended uh, donation box? Again, I, I'm assuming unintended is the box is there. Nobody's watching it. It doesn't have a camera on it. Again, I know we're playing technical here, but I, I just want to help understand because we're using these terms. And if somebody says, well, I have an attended a donation box. I have a camera on it or you know so and so watches it 24 hours a day yeah I, I don't know could, could you please help me there Madam Chair Madam Chair I was muted Miss Hewitt <laughs> thank you uh 
unattended donation boxes is a term that has been used in various pieces of legislation across the country. And I think the unattended part is, uh, I kind of stuck on that for a while because it's, you know, if they come once a week, are they attended? But I really think it is, it means in the industry that it's, there's not someone there tending to it at all times. Are there any further questions about amendments one through eight, Mr. Volke? Um, I think I don't I'm believe going to do we... two things. First, uh, yeah, we haven't moved to adopt them, so right. I, think I have to do that. But I yeah. was I was also going to respond to Mr. Prusky's point, but maybe I should make the motion first. So I'll move to adopt amendments one through eight, so it's appropriate that we have a discussion on them. Is there I'll a second, second? Councilman Prusky, so Mr. Volke can answer my question. <laughs> Okay. Thank you, uh, Councilman Prusky. They, oh, sorry, Madam Chair. My apologies. Mr. Volke, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, just briefly, Nathan Volke, District 3. Um, I'm happy to answer questions about any of the eight amendments, uh, but I did want to respond. I just, as we're sitting here, Googled unattended donation boxes and see Goodwill Industries of, the, of uh, this is Goodwill Industries of the valleys which is not the chesapeake around here but i guess it's another goodwill entity um, they call them unattended donation boxes and they just say they're 24 hours a day there's no attendant on duty at any time and tax receipts are unavailable at the location um, so i do think this is a term that's used throughout the industry um, particularly in the nonprofit world um, with respect to what they call these boxes um, which are by the way quite heavy um, they're metal boxes they're outside i don't know that it would be particularly easy to move them um, if one had to relocate them on the property. I think that would be a pretty significant amount of effort, at least all of them that I've seen. Um, but with that, like I said, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions about the amendments, but I don't want to belabor them. Mr. Prusky. Madam Chair, I want to thank my colleague and Ms. Schuett. The, the only reason why I ask, honestly, is that we're asking folks to do this and somebody says, well, I have a camera on there and you don't define what unintended is. That's all I'm saying. If we don't put it in the code, uh, I'll tell you a certain situation came up when we were discussing medical marijuana when the planning and zoning officer at the time said it can't be near church. Well, guess what? Church was never defined in the code. That's why I say that again, somebody's interpretation of what's there. That's the only reason why I asked. I get it, you know, from that end, but I don't want somebody coming back and saying, again, a, a store owner is attending it once a day and checking it for me or have a camera on it, but it, it, I get it. I just want to make sure that it's clear if somebody does come to the county, how they would respond to that. Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just, I do want to point out that in the bill on page two under section 11-17-102, section four, it does define unattended donation box means an unattended drop-off box container receptacle or similar device used for soliciting and collecting donations. So that it is defined in the bill, um, so, so it is there. Uh, I, I would certainly be open, Councilman Prusky, if you think it would be more appropriate that we make it clear that unattended, you know, would mean no camera there or, or something like that. I'm happy to work with you on the language for an additional amendment, um, but I definitely think that the amendments that we have worked through with the administration um, in large measure resolve a lot of the issues that, that at least the admin had with the bill. Are there any other questions or comments regarding amendments one through eight? Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Would it be appropriate for the administration to comment on any of the amendments if they choose? Mr. Barron. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we we're approaching 10 o'clock, so uh, if I didn't have anything to add. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the administration appreciates um, the opportunity to work through these. Uh, my hat goes off again to, to Ms. Kenny and Ms. Shewitt, who did the yeoman's job on, on uh, this um, package of amendments and administration supports. Well, this is Allison Pickard, Chair, District 2. I'm certainly appreciative of the block, even though I have not gone through the parliamentary procedure accurately tonight. We have hit the 10 o'clock mark and I'm getting tired. So are we ready to call the question on amendments one through eight? Madam Secretary, will you please call the roll on amendments one through eight? Ms. Ravian? Aye. 
Ms. Hare? Aye. Ms. Lacey? Aye. Mr. Volke? Aye. Mr. Prusky? Aye. Ms. Fiedler? Aye. Ms. Pickard? Aye. Seven in the affirmative, none in the negative. Amendments number one through eight are adopted. Bill number 72-20 as amended will be heard on October 19th, 2020. Madam Secretary, please read the title of bill number 73-20. Bill number 7320, zoning chickens and ducks in residential districts. Ms. Hare, this is your bill, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Jessica Hare, District 7. I actually, I think to introduce this bill, would just like to read the email that started it all off from the 14 year old girl in District 7. She says, Dear Ms. Hare, Hi, my name is Kira and I'm an eighth grade student at Central Middle School. I'm a Girl Scout, a good student, an SPCA volunteer, a pet a, and a pet and babysitter. I live in the Lock Haven neighborhood of Edgewater, Maryland in your district. I would like your support in getting approval to raise four chickens in my family's yard. As you know, during this COVID-19 pandemic, the governor advised we limit the trips for essential items only. Additionally, the cost of eggs has skyrocketed during the pandemic, so there has never been a better time for families to raise their own food. My family has a garden and we fish, and I would like to add fresh eggs to our diet. Based on my understanding of the Anne Arundel County regulation and permit process for chicken coops and chickens, there is no place on our 18,000 square foot lot to have a coop. We are not permitted to have a coop 25 feet from our house and the side and rear lot lines. Because we are waterfront, we are not permitted to have a coop on the water side. As a 14 year old who has a passion for all animals and the health of the environment, I would like your support in changing the setback requirements to a more reasonable distance so that kids like me can help our families bring food to the table. The city of Annapolis has a very reasonable requirement of a five foot setback. Also, it is hard for many families to keep a chicken coop more than 25 feet from their house. I really am excited and I want to work with our elected officials. I am asking you to change the regulations for the 25 foot setback of the lot lines and the house and or permit waterfront owners to place chicken coops on the water side of their houses. I look forward to working with you on this. Please contact me by email, signed Kira. I should note, I did get her permission to read that email. Um, so this, this started this all off. I thought this is fantastic. Um, some of our best ideas come from the younger residents in our community. And I emailed Miss Rhodes, spoke to her about it a number of times and said, where did we get this 25 foot setback to start with? Um, we did not want to mess with the setbacks to the side lot lines for where your neighbors might be. But I, I thought particularly long and hard about why do we have this 25 foot setback from our own house? What difference does it make if you keep a chicken coop 20 feet, 25 feet, 15 feet? Is there some rationale behind it? Uh, and Ms. Rhodes, thank you so much for your help. She did quite a bit of digging. And it looks like in the past that there, it was selected, but there was no magic math in that number either. Um, so we did go ahead and compare to the city of Annapolis. Um, Ms. Hewitt, thank you for, for chasing down this information as well. And they do have a five foot setback from your own house. Uh, we confirmed with the health department that there are no concerns with uh, lowering the setback to five feet from your own house. And so all this bill does is it changes one number from 25 feet setback from your own house to five feet from your own, set from your own house. Um, and this lovely 14 year old in district seven will get to have chickens in her backyard. So. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions. I would love your support on the bill. Would the administration like to weigh in at this time? Thank you, Madam Chair. Pete Barron with the administration. Joining me at the virtual table is the aforementioned Ms. Rhodes, our Deputy uh, Chief Administrative Officer for Land Use and Ms. Kelly Kenny from uh, the Office of Law. The administration supports this bill. Um, I hope the um, young constituent, and I hope it's not past the young constituent's bedtime. And and um, we we do think this just makes sense and appreciate the sponsor's work uh, with Ms. Rhodes to, to strike the right balance, right? We're protecting neighbors' uh, use and enjoyment of their property while, while figuring out how to make this allowable um, use for, for the particular situation at hand and also uh, addressing a sort of a, a thing that was in our code that we didn't know why so why have it right so um thank to thank you to the sponsor and um 
Thank you, as always, to Ms. Rhodes. Ms. Schuett? Thank you, Linda Schuett, Legal Counsel to the County Council. You know, I was the acting city attorney for the city of Annapolis for a while, and there is nothing more difficult than finding anything in their code. It is so hard. So I hope that the 14 year old who is, I hope is listening, you are going to be a huge success. Way to go. Ms. Rodvian. Thank you, Madam Chair, Lisa Rodvian, District 6. I'm just curious. Um, is there any distinction between the treatment of um, roosters and hens? Ms. Hare. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Jessica Hare, District 7. Yes, to my understanding, roosters are prohibited. It is hens only. So she's not asking for a, an alarm clock. Um, are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? We will now open the public hearing on bill number 73-20. Madam Secretary, do we have any tes testimony received from members of the public? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, we received one submission of uh, online written testimony, which was shared with the council and posted on the county website. We will now hear from members of the public who signed up ahead of time. We have one person signed up to speak on this bill. Remarks will be limited to two minutes. When it is your turn, please unmute yourself and begin by stating your name and address for the record. We will begin with Ms. Anna Cheney. Ms. Cheney, are you with us? Ms. Cheney. Ms. Cheney was with us earlier this evening. She might have called it in. Um, Thank you. The public hearing on bill number 73-20 is now closed. Madam Secretary, please read the title of bill number 73-20. Bill number 73-20, an ordinance concerning chicken and ducks in residential districts. Is there any further discussion at this time? Ms. Ito. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will be quick. I just want to say kudos to Kira, wherever you are out there, and I hope your chickens provide you dozens of eggs for years to come. Madam Secretary, please call the roll on bill number 73-20. Ms. Rodvian? Aye. Ms. Hare? Aye. Ms. Lacey? Fuck. Um, <coughs> taking that as an aye? Indeed, uh, aye. Mr. Volke? Uh, can't top that, aye. Mr. Pruski? Aye. Ms. Fiedler? Aye. <laughs> Ms. Pickard? Aye. Seven in the affirmative, none in the negative. Bill number 7320 is passed. Madam Secretary, please read the title of bill number 74-20. Bill number 7420, an ordinance concerning finance, taxation, and budget, real property taxes, public safety officers, property tax credit. Ms. Hare, this is your bill. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, Jessica Hare, District 7. I'll try and be quick because I know we talked about this at the work session. Um, if, we, if we all go back to March when um, the County Executive's emergency powers first began, the, the primary reason that was given at that um, meeting that was called was to extend these deadlines um, you know, for people so that nobody lost out on a right they might otherwise have during parts of the shutdown. Uh, one of those deadlines was, in fact, these tax credits, the public safety tax credits for the firefighters, police, uh, first responders, et cetera. Um, those deadlines were, in fact, extended. And then in June, the tolling of those deadlines was lifted. So this tax credit deadline actually expired um, July 13th, I believe it was. And a firefighter had reached out to me noting that he was not able to meet the deadline as a result of well, in part, he didn't he didn't know that the deadline had had been lifted, but also that, you know, with the county buildings being closed, it was much harder to get business accomplished. Um, and and so, in this particular year, given everything that's going on, I think it's important that we do everything that we can to um, make sure uh, that we're supporting our 
our first responders, that the tax credits that we offer are able to be um, taken advantage of by our residents. This has obviously been an economically challenging time for people as well as a, a challenging time for health. And so this bill, all it does is extend the deadline for the filing of this tax credit um, through, I believe it's the end of November. Uh, so this would give this firefighter time. I did talk to finance. I know that I believe there's at least one other firefighter who may have missed the deadline or one other application that came in late that they had to reject. So there are potentially a handful of people who really could benefit um, from this deadline being extended. Um, and like I said, it just, it seems like the right thing to do given the economic and health uncertainties of this particular year that we give everybody ever, every opportunity to um, take advantage of those tax credits. Would the administration like to weigh in at this time on Bill 74-20? Thank you, Madam Chair, Pete Barron with the administration. Uh, sticking with me is Ms. Kenny from the Office of Law. Um, the uh, councilwoman said it right. I think it's it's a oh, and Ms. McQuaid joined us. Great. Um, so from Office of Finance, we also have Ms. McQuaid. If there are any uh, technical questions, um, uh, the sponsor said it correct. It's a it's a tough year for everybody. This is uh, uh, extending this deadline is is something the administration supports. Have no objection at all. I gave some detail at the work session. I don't feel the need to repeat it here. So happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions uh, regarding 74-20 at this time? Seeing none, we will now open the public hearing on bill number 74-20. Madam Secretary, do we have any testimony received from members of the public? Uh, no, Madam Chair, we've received no submissions of uh, written online testimony on this bill. Thank you. We did not have any members of the public sign up to speak. Therefore, the public hearing on bill number 74-20 is now closed. Madam Secretary, please read the title of bill number 74-20. Bill number 74-20, an ordinance concerning finance, taxation, and budget, real property taxes, public safety officers, property tax credit. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on bill number 74-20. Ms. Rodvian? Aye. Ms. Hare? Aye. Ms. Lacey? Aye. Mr. Volke? Aye. Mr. Kreisky? Aye. Ms. Fiedler? Aye. Ms. Pickard? Aye. Seven in the affirmative, none in the negative. Bill 7420 is passed. Madam Secretary, please read the title of resolution number 40 20. Resolution 4020, resolution approving the nomination of a member to the Anne Arundel County Human Relations Commission. Um, this is a administration resolution. I am also a co-sponsor. Mr. Barron, you have the floor. It's me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Kaylee Schultz from the County Executive's Office. Um, just, I will be brief. Um, resolution 4020 appoints Lakeisha Hatcher to the Human Relations Commission for a term expiring November 17th, 2021. The District 2 seat was held by Pastor John Watts, who resigned from the commission for personal reasons on August 31st. Ms. Hatcher will complete Pastor Watts' term as her initial term. And I would like to thank Madam Chair for the recommendation to the County Executive to appoint Lakeisha Hatcher to the Human Relations Commission. You should have her resume in front of you. Thank you, Ms. Schultz, for your uh, help with this. Um, obviously, the Human Relations Commission is important and uh, Allison Pickard, Chair, District 2. Um, Miss, as we put it out in our community that we needed um, a representative for District 2, Ms. Hatcher was the first to respond, and not only was she the first res to respond, but was with a very enthusiastic letter of interest. And I've actually met Ms. Hatcher um, a few times. Um, she's also the president of her HOA in um, the Severn area. I think she'll be an asset to the Human Re Relations Commission and I um, would like to ask for my colleagues' support. Thank you. 
Is there any further discussion? Madam Secretary, please call the roll on resolution number 40 20. Ms. Rodman? Aye. Ms. Hare? Aye. Ms. Lacey? Aye. Mr. Volke? Aye. Mr. Prusky? Aye. Ms. Fiedler? Aye. Ms. Pickard? Aye. Seven in the affirmative, none in the negative. Resolution 4020 is adopted. Madam Secretary, please read the title of resolution number 41-20. Resolution 4120, resolution recognizing Monday, October 12, 2020 as Indigenous Peoples Day in Anne Arundel County. Ms. Rodvian is the sponsor of this resolution. Um, Ms. Rodvian, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Lisa Rodvian, District 6. Um, I really wanted to uh, follow a trend that's uh, come up in different parts of the country, especially in places in the country that have large, larger numbers of um, indigenous populations. Um, basically, we, as, as we've looked more at history in, um, you know, in, in recent years, in the past several decades, um, we've learned that Christopher Columbus um, maybe didn't have the... Um, well, certainly we've, you know, as I was taught in grade school, he discovered America and that's, uh, he actually never put foot on what is now the United States. Um, he was brutal in his methods and actually even by his fellow colonists was voted out of his own governorship. Um, he did some pretty brutal things, including enslaving um, native peoples, indigenous peoples on the island that we now call Hispaniola. Um, and cut off their hands and let them bleed to death when they didn't do what he wanted them to do. Um, in fact, some were so frightened by his potential actions that they poisoned themselves. Um, and now that this research has really come to light, um, I think a lot of locations or a lot of places around the country have um, made a wise, wise move to um, adopt a, a this or to repurpose this holiday as a day to celebrate um, indigenous people. So I'm going to very briefly read, um, read the resolution. Um, whereas in 1937, the United States government in response to intense lobbying by the Knights of Columbus proclaimed October 12th to be Columbus Day. And whereas the Italian born explorer Christopher Columbus never set foot on the shores of the current United States, Whereas millions of indigenous and native people were already living in North America upon Columbus arrival to the Americas in 1492. Whereas throughout his years in the Americas, Columbus enslaved, colonized, massacred, and ultimately marginalized thousands of indigenous and native people. Whereas for native Americans, Columbus day has been, has long been a painful reminder of the hundred years of colonial oppression at the hands of European explorers and settlers and those whose wounds still run deep today. Whereas Native Americans have had a tremendous effect on American life today, including areas of art and music, law and government, conservation and environmental sustainability. And without the knowledge of and influence of Native Americans, our country would not be what it is today. Whereas since 1991, dozens of cities, several universities, and a growing number of states have adopted Indigenous Peoples Day as a holiday that celebrates the history and contributions of Native Americans. And whereas Indigenous Peoples Day is observed on the second Monday in the month of October every year by the states of Minnesota, Alaska, Maine, Louisiana, Oregon, New Mexico, Nevada, and Vermont, as well as South Dakota, which celebrates Native Americans Day, and Hawaii, which, which celebrates Discoverers Day. Whereas honoring Columbus as a hero disregards the painful legacy of violence and brutality inflicted upon the Indigenous and Native people of the Americas. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the County Council of Anne Arundel County, Maryland, that it hereby recognizes Monday, October 12, 2020 as Indigenous Peoples Day in Anne Arundel County and calls upon the people of Anne Arundel County to join their fellow citizens in recognizing this special observance. And be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be sent to the County Executive Stuart Pittman. And I'm happy to take any questions from my colleagues. Would the administration like to weigh in on this um, resolution? Mr. Barron. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in the interest of time, I, I don't have anything uh, particular to say. I appreciate the, the hard work uh, Councilwoman Ravi and put in and, and 
which I helped draft the uh, statement you just read. It's, it's powerful stuff. The administration supports and and the county exec looks forward to receiving the resolution. Are there any questions from my colleagues for Ms. Radvian? Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Nathan Volke, District 3. Um, I, I want to thank Ms. Radvian for putting together, as Mr. Barron said, this extensive um, history and, and additional information. I did have a question um, about how this works logistically. So currently, I think the federal holiday is Columbus Day. If we're to adopt this as Indigenous Peoples Day, does that supplant or is that together with Columbus Day? How, how does that work with respect to the county and what we're technically doing? Or are we are we getting rid of Columbus Day and this becomes the new October 12th celebration or do they operate simultaneously? I wasn't clear on that from the resolution, so I, I would appreciate any clarification. I'll, I'll tell you that the intent was to have this in place of Columbus Day. Okay, Ms. thank you. Oh, Ms. Fiedler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Amanda Feather, District 5. I'm actually going to lead, uh, yield to Ms. Shewitt, who had her, I think, hand raised in response. Ms. Shewitt. Thank you. Uh, this is a resolution. So with state law and the Maryland rules define what the holidays are, and the resolution can't change that legal definition or the legal statement of what a holiday is. Um, I think it, 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 the resolution evidences an intent, intent that Anne Arundel County used that term in connection with celebrations or whatever may happen, but it doesn't change anything legally. Thank you. Ms. Fiedler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I want to thank Councilwoman Rodbian for um, going back and forth with me over the past few days. Um, and I think that the uh, resolution reads stronger, um, sharing some history of indigenous people. Uh, but my one question is, is there any information on um, any existing tribes in Anne Arundel County that we have any information on? Um, that would be helpful. I would have loved to have seen that in the language, but. Okay, so um, the Maryland Commission on Indian Affairs recognizes um, a number of um, indigenous tribes and I can list them for you because I think um, hearing their names and knowing who um, were the original inhabitants of this land is important and very interesting. Um, so the, the tribes that are recognized and, and these are actually not the only ones um, that are, you know, that have populations in Maryland, but these are the ones that are recognized by the Maryland Commission on Indian Affairs. It's the Akahanic Indian tribe, the Assateague Peoples tribe, the Cedarville Band of Piscataway Indians, the Nase Walwash Band of Indians, the Piscataway Kanoi Confederacy and Subtribes, the Piscataway Indian Nations, the Pocomoke Indian Nations, and the Yakagani River Band of Shawnee Indians. So those are the, um, the seven tribes that are recognized by the state of Maryland. So you can see we have a lot of Piscataway influence here. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on resolution number 41-20. Ms. Radmin? Aye. Ms. Hare? Aye. Ms. Lacey? Aye. Mr. Volke? Aye. Mr. Pruski? Aye. Ms. Fiedler? Aye. Ms. Pickard? Aye. Seven in the affirmative, none in the negative. Resolution number 4120 is adopted. Okay. Is there any other business to be brought before the County Council at this time? Mr. Volke? Motion to adjourn, Madam Chair. Councilman Pruski, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. The county council is adjourned. Where's my gavel? The county council is adjourned until 6 p.m. on October 19th, 2020. Well done, colleagues. This was a great meeting. Thank you, everyone.